We're alive. All right. <laughs> Not for me. <laughs> My screen is all messed up, but I'll take your word for it. <laughs> well, I see that we're on uh, on Facebook. So welcome, everybody, to the next night talk. And today we're here with uh, my distinguished colleagues, John <laughs> Bulo and John Scolari. So we got two Johns in the gym. And that's going to cause all kinds of trouble. We're sure that the intro video is, is gone because I'm seeing it right now and all it's yes. blurry. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> anyway, um, so we're going to be talking about our favorite subject, the Capital High Q Library, and all of the good stuff that is found therein, including the soundtrack to Night of the Living Dead. Um, oh man, that, hold on a second, that is just going to annoy the crap out of me. Um, I, I'm telling you, the video is like playing from what I could see, but anyway, um, uh, so maybe explain a little bit why you guys are here and, and what you like about the Capital High Q library, besides the the cues that are in Night of the Living Dead, but as a whole, what uh, you know, what distinguishes that music from from other music for you guys? <laughs> Which John goes first? How about I mean, you guys? You guys are gonna have to fight that out. <laughs> John, you, what, you what go first. You, you, you have, you have uh, seniority. <laughs> okay. Um, you, you know, for me, it's one of those things that from my first viewing of Night of the Living Dead when I was nine in uh, 1979 um, through, you know, repeated viewings on VHS when I first got my copy. I never knew that the music for Night of the Living Dead wasn't created specifically for it. It fits so perfectly. Um, so I just loved it. And it was only kind of years later that I started to notice recognizable cues turning up in other places on the lone ranger on uh, uh teenagers from outer space seeing these other movies and it's like hey, that's night of the living dead so um, uh, uh let me ask you that question so you you were recognizing night of the living dead music before you knew that it was in other productions before you knew that it was uh capital high q or just library yeah. you know what library music even was in general you know, most people. Yeah, didn't I didn't. Know. I didn't really become aware of that until I got the very Sarabande soundtrack album, right. and that that had kind of that introduction, which is like, oh, right. that's that's what this is. Um, but I, I, I would that, say that was on on. Uh, so you got that on release, I guess eighty two, eighty three, uh, or maybe after a couple, a couple years later. Um, so I, yeah, I bought I, it in the record store. I you know didn't didn't order it on, you know, through like Starlog when, uh, right. where it was early advertisements or. Yeah. So yeah, the, uh, I want to point out the, uh, very Saraban, um, LP, uh, the same deal with, um, uh, what is this message I'm getting? Anyway, the same, uh, the very Saraban LP, um, as you're saying, they, you know, in Fangoria and Starlog, it was advertised that you could buy these soundtracks 
Um, that was probably the only way that I would have ever <laughs> known it was available. And um, Night of the Living Dead was one, and that's where I first learned, and probably just about everybody else learned that uh, it uses library music and what library music actually is. But uh, even more importantly was the Dawn of the Dead soundtrack, because yeah. um, I couldn't see Dawn of the Dead uh, when that LP came out. And maybe it was maybe it was before '82. It's hard hard to remember. Um, but I couldn't actually see Dawn of the Dead yet because when it came out, you know, I was wasn't of age, and um, but you could get this um, LP, and then a couple of years later. I was able to sneak in to a drive-in viewing of Dawn of the Dead. That's how I first saw it. I think it was probably the couple of years after its initial release. But in the meantime, I had this LP and was listening to the music and can only picture, you know, what this, how cool this movie was going to be. <laughs> and then the startling thing was that the most of the music was not in the movie. <laughs> and then that's when we learned that Dawn of the Dead also used at least George Romero's version used you know heavy heavy use of library music uh, from a different library but uh still the same it was the same uh, uh music of mystery <laughs> we couldn't yeah. figure out where any of this great stuff was coming from so what about you john where did you uh what, what, what's your first experience with this library music junk <laughs> it probably was dawn first because uh, I know I've told you that Dawn's always my number one, but Night is a, is a pretty strong second. And uh, at the time, I saw Dawn and, and Night probably around 1996. So I think I was a little bit lucky that a lot of the like re-releases of like the Goblin soundtrack, uh, the 20th anniversary one, uh, came out in like 1998. And uh, I always just like the you know even how I am, like the music I normally just enjoy. I like when the music tells me how to feel, not so much like the words. So even as like a young kid, I really liked soundtrack music, like uh, uh, Edward Scissorhands, or even when I was really young, uh, Dick Tracy. But there's something about those library tracks. It's so like quirky. Sometimes they could be so like unusual. And that's how it was with, with Dawn for me. And I got the, the trunk release that came out I don't know when, 2004 or something. I don't know when, exactly when it came out. But I think that was my first real exposure that like, oh, there's like library tracks and, uh, you know, these things get used and, you know, you just pay to use them and they get, you know, put in movies and stuff. And uh, it's with Night, it's, it's different because usually when I really like a movie, I also have to really like the music. And I think just like uh, John number two said, maybe John number one, seniority, uh, it, it just fit and they really have to go hand in hand. I can't think of many movies that I love or I don't like the music. And I don't think I can think of any movie where I just like the music and don't like the movie. They have to really work hand in hand. And I think Hook. that. Sorry. Oh, yeah? yeah. Did the music for what? that? Danny Elfman? No, it's a John, John Williams score. Unwatchable oh. movie, but but some beautiful music. <laughs> yeah, I remember it as a kid, but I don't, I don't remember the music. But uh, and actually, you know, I, I I feel weird because you guys are saying you know when the LP came out, and I was born in 1983, <laughs> so uh, I was not old enough for that. I'm I'm sorry to, to, to tell you guys, but uh, I did find the CD. I have it up there. The the collection the. Uh, uh, what is it called exactly? Uh, they won't stay dead. Which they won't stay dead. dead. For which yeah. we all owe Jim a great debt of gratitude. And that, and that was my introduction to Jim before I even knew who he was. Because I, I found that somewhere and I bought it immediately. As well yeah, as the, uh, Opsy of the Dead. At, at the last Living Dead weekend, I was going and, and it was the first time I was meeting John in person. John too, in person. <laughs> I was bringing him a copy of They Won't Stay Dead, and he was like, I already got that. <laughs> okay, I'm going to have to come up a, a, with a better gift <laughs> than that. But because, uh, uh, you know, uh, our we met through music, through yeah. uh, John's videos, on, of instructional videos on a guitar player 
the guitar uh, player and musician, Alan Oldsworth. So um, I was really impressed with what he did with that. And, uh, and it was funny because in all of his videos, he's got a Dawn of the Dead poster behind him. And it's like, it's everywhere. It's all over the place. <laughs> I, got, I got some up there. You know, I, even on yeah. the strap of my guitar, I have a night, dawn, and day pin. You know, it's like, it's just, it's just my stuff. But actually, speaking of Alan, that's like exactly the reason why I love his music. Because, um, like I said, for me, I really enjoy it when the music tells me how to feel, not necessarily having to be told how to feel, you know, through words, which is fine. You know, uh, uh, you know, I like music that has lyrics in it, but I think there's something stronger when an artist or composer really understands their craft and can really milk the emotion out of, um, out of you just from the music. I mean, I think a perfect example, something like Halloween, which was my first favorite until I saw Dawn, where I remember uh, reading that, you know, they made the movie and they watched it, and it just wasn't scary. And then John Carpenter threw together a score, and then all of a sudden it was terrifying. And to me, that right. really power of the music really enhancing what you're seeing. But you can just almost turn off, you know, the the video and listen to the music and still really experience what you're trying to, what the composer is trying to make you feel. And so. Carry on with that thought for a second. I just have to check something here in this room, and I'll be right back. I think <laughs> you guys can. Hang you you hit a strong point that I strongly agree with John, and that is that um, a really good soundtrack <clears throat> can basically allow you to relive the film without the visuals, without the dialogue, without anything else. Um, and I think my my favorite film scores do that, whether they're original or, like I said, in the case of something like this, where the library music becomes, you know, it's kind of owned by Night of the Living Dead, right? Let's face yeah. it. I, I, maybe there are some people that would say, no, no, Killer Shrews did it first. Well, they, I, well I think uh, um, to your points about how music is an important part of the, of you know, the film experience, um, even further with something like Night of the Living Dead or like, say, Star Wars. You know, Star Wars was a big one in terms of, um, the, if you remember, um, you know, here here we are dating ourselves again, but in 77 when Star Wars came out, it was one of the main, uh, you know, soundtrack LPs that, you know, I'm sure kids were, I mean, I was a kid and bought it and was just, you know, I wasn't uh, musically, I wasn't doing anything musically at that point. Um, and, uh, you know, that was, you know, years later I began playing guitar, but um, it had very detailed liner notes that where John Williams was talking about things like segues and, um, you know, this bit of music segues to this. And, and he just made these very intelligent liner notes, uh, not, not playing the audience for a bunch of idiots. And um, that left a big impression, almost as much as the music. And when there was a movie like that, or like Night of the Living Dead, or like Dawn of the Dead, that left a great impression on you, you want, you know, we couldn't own uh, VHS back then or anything like that. So the music was important. You could buy the music and play it at home. There was your little piece of the film that you could relive, you know, great moments and stuff. And if uh, if I can piggyback your point just for a little bit, you know, for like major motion pictures where, you know, there's a, a large budget, you know, after the movie's sort of completed, a composer can watch the movie and say, okay, I'm going to give this theme to character A, I'm going to write this melody for character B, this melody for character C, and then watch the movie and then do intelligent things like, oh, maybe when uh, character A and B are talking and they're angry, you play the themes, but you do it in a in a dissonant, aggressive way, or when they're, you know, feeling happy, you play the same melody in a nice, happy, you know, in, in a nice way, in a pleasing way. Or, or you want to do those callbacks. You just, you just know how to, you bring in a certain theme and it's like the audience reacts yeah. because we've associated that. With so the composer actually, you know, they're talented enough to know what they're doing to manipulate 
your emotion with what you're seeing on the screen. Uh, but that costs money. Now, the problem is if you've got like a low budget and you don't have any ability to do that, well, that's where library tracks are actually really great to have because for a price, you also have very talented composers that are writing general pieces of music purely for a tone. You know, this is uh, action, this is suspense, this is drama, you know, this is tension, this is whatever. And somebody without the budget can take that music that someone else had, had written and then try to fit piece it into their movie. And it worked really, really well for George because not only did uh, they didn't have the money to do it, but uh, from what I believe, he had to have some intuitiveness to know how to bring the best from the scene by pairing it with the best music instead of having, let's say, a composer sort of do it for you. And I think, and we'll we'll get to this throughout this discussion. George does it really well. Oftentimes, you'll see it's kind of ham-fisted, like <laughs> it's like let's use this theme in such a way that it doesn't fit at all with what's going I agree. on the screen. But in George's case, it, you know, I, I can't think of examples where it doesn't fit. Um, and again, that's yeah, he he not it. only. Uh, he not yeah. only makes it, um, he not only fits what's going on perfectly, but he also, um, he'll also pair, like in the case of Dawn of the Dead, he'll pair things that don't quite fit together and he makes a different mood. So he's, he's not doing, you know, these, these cues are packaged, you know, under mood titles. And in some cases, George is going against what it's packaged as and pairing it with a different visual that just makes it something new and something unique. So he has that going for him, but also um, what we're going to get into this in a minute, the breadth of these um, music libraries, whether it's Capital High Q or DeWolf, which are the two that he used on night and then on dawn, um, there are so many cues and to whittle it down to what he did, and then the choices that he made are just amazing for a for a non musician for somebody that's not doing mu it musically, but is doing it by just their intuition. Um, he had a great intuitive sense, as as has been said, um, yes. by what by what he picked, and and we're going to get to some specific examples of that. So let's move ahead there. Before, and before let's, we jump ahead, Jim, I think it's. Yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> it's worth as part of your kind of bio to this topic, at least talking about how you went from fan of this to collector that was able to identify, find, amass it, and put out basically the the first full, almost complete soundtrack to Night of the Living Dead. Thank you. <laughs> well, it, it, that was done... Um, like anything else, because because it didn't exist. <laughs> so, in, in fact, everybody who's been asking, you know, when is it coming out again? The the, uh, the waxwork vinyl LP is the more complete version, and that's yes. basically built off of all the um, all the source cues that I originally had, and then we found a few more things, and then uh, the bigger. Um, addition is that we've you know by that point we had the uh, audio the uh, raw audio that was packaged with george's with the work print that george put together of night that would be the work print of night would be the uh, the 16 millimeter work print that would be basically his blueprint that was his original edit and the audio the diff the different audio stems are all bundled together with that so we were able to go in and get those bits and pieces that are not from Capital IQ, but are either manipulated um, music cues with a, with a tape delay or, you know, various other effects, um, crude effects that they would have had at the time, or even some very rudimentary synthesized effects um, that are amazing how they came up with that. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we could talk a little bit about that. But um, it, that it was just done because it didn't exist. You know, one thing led to another. And, um, you know, I wanted, 
when I realize that, um, uh, you know, we're talking about like kind of the discovery of library music. When I realized the very Saraband release is like 60% of the music at best, that did, that didn't sit well. <laughs> so it was time to, uh, to find the other tracks. And once I did find them, um, then, well, why not put them out? And, uh, so that's that's all that was uh, going on there. Um, did you we just had a few the library, or did you did you What's... were you able to acquire a whole set from somebody? Oh no, it was piecemeal. In fact, I acquired um, probably about three times of what I was originally working with, um, three times the amount um, after I had put out the um, the capital of the uh, they won't stay dead CD. So probably like a few years after that, um, you know, uh, uh, several other um, collections came up for sale and it just filled in so many gaps. And then that's why that one cube was found that was missing the first time. So um, even when you think you're done, you just, if you keep looking, you'll find more. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, for we, anybody who's got the Waxwork album but hasn't cracked it open, you're missing out because there is stuff on there that has not been available elsewhere. It's definitely but worth it, listening. But no CD. I can't get it because I'm actually, I do have a, a vinyl player, but uh, yeah, I'm, I, I like to listen to it in my car or something. So I need to... Well, we have a, a few comments here. Um, Greg is saying that um, he was old enough to have seen Dawn of the Dead first run in the drive in with friends. And, um, his first exposure from the music from Night of the Living Dead was in a Gumby cartoon, which is absolutely <laughs> correct. The, yeah. uh, Gumby, all, you know, also low budget production. And, uh, and so they licensed capital IQ music. And that was actually uh, Gumby using that um, high Q music was actually a ended up being like a licensing problem when they, uh, you know, years later, it was it maybe, 10 years ago when they tried to reissue Gumby, they actually replaced the soundtrack. And that's what several um, productions or, uh, or the distribution of several older productions like Tales from the Dark Side, the original uh, um, music was left off of the home video release because it's just not worth it to go back and try to, try to relicense all of that material again. And uh, do I, uh, Dwayne is saying, um, a show of hands, who had the Miko uh, Star Wars disco album? Well, I didn't have the album. I had the um, single. <laughs> Just the single. <laughs> I had the single before I had the, the John Williams store. Uh, John, too, doesn't understand what we're talking about when we say Miko. <laughs> What's disco? No, I, you know, What's I, disco? I, I actually have, I have something to admit. Because uh, I actually have never seen Star Wars. Yeah, I'm that person. I'm that you, one person. Wait, you've never seen what? I've never seen Star Wars. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so he's yeah. <laughs> he's no longer qualified to be on this right now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, that just means that you're such a lucky guy to have. Uh, opportunities for entertainment in your future. Yeah. <laughs> well, he could watch the Phantom Menace first, and then, then he's in trouble. So. Yeah. <laughs> then, then he won't understand why anybody likes this crap. So. <laughs> no, it's like one of those things where it's it's so ingrained into like popular culture. I basically, you know, it's not like I have no idea what happens in the movie. I just like to be unique at this point to say like, well, let's see how long I can go to that I. That I can say. <laughs> When the zombie apocalypse happens, he's gonna hold up in a mall and watch Star Wars. Then you'll then you'll get around. To, well, look, I haven't watched. A, I've barely watched any Marvel, Marvel, superhero films. I watched a bit of Harry Potter. Other than that, I've never seen any Harry Potter. So there's a lot of franchises I haven't seen. But when you were ten, you know, ten years old, I, I was ten years old when Star Wars came out. Maybe nine years old. Um, there was nothing like that. Because science fiction films were, you know, if you like science fiction, they were these, you know, very dystopian, the future is going to be really bad, 
um, type films, and they just weren't really taken seriously. There, there were big budget ones like Logan's Run and uh, The Planet of the Apes. You know, that, that was popular, but that, that had already run its course, um, you know, rather quickly. And um, we just had stuff like Logan's Run. I don't know what were a few other ones. Westworld. Westworld was a good one. But it's not something that, you know, was, uh, again, you know, those, those are based in kind of like, uh, they're science fiction and futuristic, but they're kind of based in the horror uh, genre a bit. You know, like what's wrong with society and stuff, and and basically, it's all these warning. Uh, you know, these these films have big warnings to them about what's coming. You know, like a brave new world. You know, the that would yeah, be like the equivalent. Yeah, and exactly the guy who made Star Wars. You know, made one of those films himself. So um, uh, prior to Star Wars, so when Star Wars came out, it was just like this big fun thing, and. Um, and it, you know, it had all the bells, and, and and it did push the envelope. You know, that's that's an important thing to remember. It's it's not just like they were doing, um, you know, they were just regurgitating what, what, whatever else had come out. You know, science fiction films were these big serious things, and then all of a sudden you had this fun one, but it had the technology, and they just really advanced what you were seeing visually. That that made like a big impression, and. Um, it, it, it was also the time of, you know, Happy Days and American Graffiti. And, you know, American Graffiti is also George Lucas. And when you think about it, that's really all Star Wars is. is he says it's Flash Gordon, but it's really just American Graffiti with yeah. the, with spaceships. So, and anybody, uh, anybody that wants to talk bad about George, let us remember that the George Lucas Family Foundation was a huge help in the restoration for <laughs> Night of the Long yeah. Dead. So... George Lucas Family Trust and uh, the Celeste Bartos Family Trust. So yeah. we owe a great debt to them. Uh, he, uh, George Lucas is a big um, proponent of preserving film, actual film. So um, preserving Night of the Living Dead uh, seemed to be a big, uh, a no-brainer for you know, the, for the, uh, uh, and the film foundation as well. Can't leave them yeah. out, which is Martin Scorsese's film preservation organization. So, um, uh, it seemed to be a no brainer that, um, you know, these big organizations that, um, like the museum of modern art could get involved in preserving night of the living dead because it's American film. So, uh, we, yeah, we, you know, I, I have been angry at George Lucas for, you know, changing the original Star Wars, you know, more ways than it than it should have been. Um, I like the original with all its flaws, and uh, there was, like I said, there was nothing else quite like it, and it should have won the Oscar instead of Annie Hall. Annie Hall is not that great of a movie, in my opinion. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that's for another. Uh, <laughs> that's for a Star Wars talk when we get around to that. So um, let's uh, back up for a second and talk about. Um, or at least preface what a library music actually is and what the Capital High Q library is. So, um, it, you know, I could go three hours on that myself, so I think it would be better if you uh, talk about that, John, and um, and we'll add in some John number one. <laughs> sure, sure. You can just call me Vulo. Okay. okay, Vulo. Yeah. yeah. I have that kind of last name. <laughs> so just kind of at a, at a high level, Capital High Q Library was one of the biggest music libraries in North America, um, divided into five categories. And Jim knows all this because Jim is like, Jim is an expert on, on so many of these things. Um, but you had D for dramatic. So like you're seeing on screen here, L for light, M for melodic, S for short for very short cues and X for extra, which could be things that didn't fit uh, anywhere else. Um, it was really, oops, it was really uh, um, the X series was the very specialized or um, uh, I want to say homegrown. That's not a good, uh, what, you know, what would you call like, a, you know, if you needed a, you needed a, um, 
you know, a waltz or you needed a, um, uh, you know, you needed a, like a classical waltz or you needed, um, you know, a version of Yankee Doodle Dandy in your production or a marching band, you know, just playing something very generic. That's what would be in the, the X series or uh, the specialized series. So there was a lot of things like that. Uh, you know, just off the top of my head, I would say like pipe organs and, um, you know, when you're just trying to have like background cathedral music or something like that, it, it tended to be all that stuff. Um, just to break down those categories a bit, um, because it, because they are vast, you, as you can see, this is, um, uh, oh, let me back up one second. So um, the Capital High Q Library came in two forms. There was actual LPs, and that's where the term needle drop comes from, because you could you basically just see, you could see this, this one is a D41, the dramatic uh, series, real 41, and there would have been a flip side, which would have been D42, and you can see D41 has eight cues on it, and they're all tension or, you know, very dramatic, um, <laughs> when we, you know, suspense music. And uh, on this particular one that we're seeing, Q7 is the cemetery pursuit in Night of the Living Dead. So how would you know that, you know, from how you, you just on this one alone is is eight, eight different cues and you're looking for suspense music. Well, that's the purpose of these vinyl records is you can just quickly move the needle and do a needle drop and, you know, oh, I don't like this one. Go to the next one. I don't like this one. Oh, that one sounds good and make a note of it. And, you know, and I'm sure that's how Carl and Carl Hardman and George Romero had to go through it to get to the stuff that was uh, important. And um, the other way it was released would have been these reel-to-reel -reel tapes. And in that case, you could see it would be very difficult to, to, to quickly go through. You know, here you have uh, five uh, tracks, and track one, space drama, is important because that's the tire iron attack music. And you can see it's quite long. So um, it's helpful if you're trying to pick music for a scene, it's helpful to know that, uh, you know, you have a long cue here. You may have a long scene like the tire iron attack, which goes on for a couple minutes, and which is why George would have picked a longer cue. Or going back to this, I mean, the cemetery, um, cemetery pursuit scene is also long. Well, what, and you can see the cue is only... A minute 46 uh, what George does in that scene is he actually loops it uh, he cuts back into it so uh, you know having quick access to it would have been key because as you can see there's just uh, there's just too much to listen to and um, going back to this the uh, reels what you would do is uh, I guess some uh, sound facilities, whether they were radio stations or um, post-production facilities, had reason to have reel-to-reel -reel tapes. So in this case, this is the very early Capital IQ. You can see it's D1 through D24, and there's two reels per, per uh, disc or whatever uh, tape reel, um, whereas this black box one is... 15 IPS, so it's going to use a lot more tape, so it's just one reel on here. And um, here at the start, they already had 24 <laughs> reels of dramatic music to listen to. So if you're in the middle of trying to cut a TV uh, episode or a commercial or whatever, that is a lot of stuff to go through. So the LPs served as audition discs, and you could basically get a bunch of these LPs and go through them really quick and be able to find the pieces and you know that you needed, and then you could make your order to Capital High Q and say I need you know uh, GM 404, and then I need you know TC uh, 126 uh, uh, and so forth, and you would just make your cue sheet and send it to them, and then they would cut the 
better quality reel to reel tapes and then send those over to you. So uh, that's generally how it worked. The way it worked with George and George Romero and Carl Hardman, you know, two separate companies coming together to make Night of the Living Dead. Carl was the uh, the Hardman Associates was the uh, facility that had all of these LPs in house. Uh, they were probably using them long before tape became a a, a bigger thing. The, the Capital High Q um, Capital High Q library started in the late fifties, and Night of the Living Dead was produced in the you know uh, late sixties. So this music. Uh, or majority of the music was a good 10 years old um, and before it ever saw any use in Night of the Living Dead. And um, at, when it was started, I would say uh, probably sound facilities like radio stations and so forth weren't using tape as much in the late 50s. And that didn't become a major thing until the 60s. So these LPs would have been important. Um, and that's obviously what, you know, what Carl started with. Um, and I was told a lot of, you know, the early stuff that they were doing for their radio programs or for their, uh, um, I guess, their sponsored advertisements or their skits, whatever the, the things that they were doing to the skits to support products or commercials were a lot of it was being done on uh, using, L, you know, needle drops, using actual needle drops, using the actual vinyl records. So it would have been later that Carl would have, or Carl's facility would have gotten, you know, multiple reel-to-reel tapes. And so I don't think in the late '50s a lot of uh, a lot of these um, uh, studios had access to to reel-to-reel tapes, so the, the records would have been the main thing. And that's how uh, Night of the Living Dead was made. Carl would have dubbed off a bunch of cues that he thought were good for the film or worked in the film, and he would have sent those tapes over to George, who would have then, you know, went through them and started picking which pieces he wanted to use. And, um, and then the process would have been, when George did find a cue that he wanted, he would have had to... Uh, dub that cue further onto 16 millimeter magnetic track, which is like a f- film strip, but it's audio. And uh, George's method for editing Night of the Living Dead and subsequent films from Night of the Living Dead was to use a, uh, a viewer with two spindles that he could pull the 16 millimeter. Uh, the, his first track would have been the, the actual film where he was making his edits. And then he had a synchronizer that would have had several slots for 16 millimeter audio and, uh, you know, the 16 millimeter magnetic tape. And he would have had to slot the bits and pieces of audio onto those tapes and sync it all up and pull it through a sound reader. And then also the the visual element, which was a screen um, that showed him, you know, his edits and showed the music or, you know, that played in sync to the music. And if he didn't like something, he'd have to pull the tapes apart. And, you know, it was held together by uh, editing tape, and he would pull those apart and put something else in. So it was a very cumbersome uh, process, to say the least. And uh, he managed to do an entire feature film that way, and then several others. Um, So that's uh, quite the Herculean feat. But um, you can see uh, here is the very early capital iq uh the l series a bunch of the l series discs and a bunch of the m series discs which carl and george use nothing from so there was just dozens and dozens if not several hundred tracks in each of these um uh, areas of the library that they just they didn't get to and um and were able to score most of it from I would say about maybe 12 or 15 different reels or discs or whatever you want to call them. Uh, the, the cues to Night of Living Dead are spread out among the, the D series mostly, and I'd say about 15 different discs or so. Jim, Paul asked, 
Um, yes. I wonder if any of these songs are still available to license from Capitol if someone wanted to use them in a movie. Uh, not from mm -hmm. Capitol, yeah. but the um, uh, we were talking about um, the soundtrack that I produced, They Won't Stay Dead. Um, and uh, uh, at the time, I well, I found out that all the rights had reverted back to the composers who either, who most of them had passed away at that point. And, the, and this was a good 10 years ago or more. Um, if, if those libraries have then been, or various, uh, what would you call it? Um, uh, batches of music from the various composers were then resold or relicensed or just went in all different directions. And um, you basically had to find out who the composer was, uh, you know, find out who represents them, the BMI, you know, BMI, which is like a music reporting service, um, which, uh, you know, basically pays the artists when you're, uh, you know, you're listening to the radio and you're hearing, you know, this song or that song, BMI keeps track of all that and, and basically pays artists uh, based on you know how much airplay they're getting and so forth or if uh, you're in a bar and there there's live music playing or there's even um uh you know a, a, a sound system playing music it's the same thing it's you know a performance and uh bmi is basically a performance reporting agency uh, the same as ascap and um BMI was really helpful because all of these musicians or their database was helpful because all these musicians have to be um, in there in order to get paid when their music is used. And uh, if anybody was getting paid for Night of Living Dead, I highly doubt it because uh, nobody seemed to know what any of this stuff was until I started like bothering them about it. And then they seem to get a little bit more in tune with it, but uh, this, but the music is available, and um, you could even see uh, uh, we had uploaded. This is just a side story, but it shows you know how far it's come. Um, as Image Ten, we had uploaded a version of Night Living Dead to do a uh, you know one of these uh, podcast watch parties, whatever you would call them, with uh, the George Romero Foundation a few years ago, and. Um, when I uploaded it to YouTube, it actually said, you can't, I got this message, you can't profit from this because it actually identified like two or three of the library tracks and had the correct names and everything. And that, that would have to be reported so that, that because the system had identified those library tracks, I couldn't put this video onto YouTube in any kind of commercial sense where I guess you would get um, you could possibly get a uh, payment from hits, you know, how many views. And uh, so I wasn't allowed to do that because it determined that there's copyrighted music in there. It has to be reported to an agency. So um, it is out there to to uh, to license if you're looking for it all. And um, that brings us up to this, which um, now that we're on the subject of payment, um, who was who was saying recently that uh well you guys had the story you, you could tell it um i think the comedian Patton oswald was saying that yes. uh so from george oswald romero was, was the, the music was free <laughs> oh you, you tell the story you tell it better than i do so, so there was just an interview Pat oswald did because i guess in his new film they used a needle drop from um the killer shrews and so the interviewer asked him, are there other examples of using music that's been previously used that you like? And he said, well, there's this music that was in Teenagers from Outer Space that George Romero used in Night of the Living Dead. And then he went on to kind of describe how George said that they used it because it was free. And so they could get this really creepy music because it was free, which wasn't the case. <laughs> um, and it looks like they, they paid $1,500, but it looks like the rate was based on it being a 90 minute running time for their theatrical feature. So I'm assuming, you know, $500 for 30 minutes or $1,000 an hour, but basically based on the running time of 90 minutes, it was a $1,500 fee. And there's uh, Vince's invoice to prove to Carl that they paid the bill. <laughs> right. 
Well, so what we're looking at is this is capital records invoice to to the uh, to image ten. Oh, actually, no, it's to uh, Hardman Associates because uh, Hardman Associates would have had the um, the the account with them, and um, but it was paid by Image Ten by the Leighton Image, and uh, Vince Servinsky actually cut the check for it. He's got his. You could see all his record keeping. I think this would have been. You could see the parts that are the capital high Q or the capital records um, invoice themselves, but then you can see all the typing and stamps <laughs> that Vince put all over it. So, like the you know he wrote the check number and the payment date. It was uh, paid November. Well, that can't be right. November nineteen sixty five. I think he made a mistake there. So I was going to ask about that. <laughs> they weren't even making the movie back then, but um. Uh, so they did, you know, it was paid for, and um, uh, that was the great thing at that time. You could just go to Capital Records, Capital Haiku, and they were like a clearinghouse. Um, like, uh, so as John has said, um, you know, it was it w was the biggest, probably the biggest library at the time because it was pulling in. There was other libraries before. In fact, Capital Records had Capital Q. It would be, you know, preceded Capital High Q, um, but that was a previous library with another company, and it was just sublicensed by Capital Records, and um, or their production music division, and they weren't allowed to license it for uh, for uh, film. It could only be used on television, so that's what got the people in charge there. Um, I guess thinking about this and they figured, well, if we could start our own music library, we don't have to sub license this material and we could, uh, um, you know, use it. We could, so it could be used for everything. And that's what started Capital High Q. Um, a little bit about that, the people involved, it was, uh, Capital High Q was started by composer William Luce and uh, also a musician, I believe he was a piano player, John Seeley, but he didn't really write anything for this particular library. It was Bill Luce who did. And uh, what they did was they, at the time, um, probably because of the restrictions on the other library music that they were licensing, they went to composer David Rose, this gentleman, and had him write this guy must have been very pro prolific because he just wrote a ton of material and sold it to them outright. And that was the catch of the whole um, endeavor was to, uh, uh, he was going to be paid big sum of money, probably by the minute, um, to write these themes, these music themes. Uh, they used to call this like light music Um he was just going to write these themes and uh, sell them outright and not receive any credit or royalties or so forth. Um, and Bill Luce then would write an equitable number of cues, which do appear in the library. But I believe there were some other composers in there as well. And he didn't get the, uh, or I was going to say Bill Luce got the credit for it. So uh, what we're looking at here is, um, you can see the codes next to the track names and the codes are unique, whereas the track names are kind of generic. And uh, so this is, you know, the one, the very first track we're looking at, 1TC401. This is how they could uh, figure out, you know, how the reporting could be kept accurate and the composers could get paid. Well, TC is short for ThemeCraft and ThemeCraft was the the label or the designation that they put that Luce and Seeley put all of this material that they acquired, some from David Rose and some from William Luce. But at the end of the day, they were the ones, Seeley and Luce were the ones who were going to get paid for it. And there was probably some other composers in there as well. In fact, we know that there were, and we'll get to that as well. But uh, they, whether or not they were paid or it was a buyout situation, is hard to say at this point. Um, but the way you can tell, 
uh, what, what I was told, the way you could tell who wrote what is you see some of these numbers are quite high, like 401. That would have been something that Bill Luce wrote, or at least Bill Luce and his maybe um, compadre of composers, other composers there that he had writing stuff. Uh, this would have been that material. Whereas like this uh, TC48, that would have been David Rose, the stuff that's that's numbered very early on or very very low in the numbering system would have been David Rose. And we're going to see there's a ton of that in Night of the Living Dead because, well, there's, they're going to say there's a ton of it in Capital High Q. Uh, so, of course, some of it made its way into Night of the Living Dead. Um, but that's how you can better determine, at least in this case, the that's the, uh, what would it be called? The, like, the main part of the library. And then they went further and brought in all these other composers from overseas. And uh, and then also the material was recorded overseas to get around paying the musicians union, which is why everybody started <laughs> using um, music libraries in the first place. Whenever this stuff would have you know, started appearing on television, uh, which would have been frequent, um, the musicians union had to be, you know, you had to pay the musicians union and they didn't like doing that. So, you know, as most producers <laughs> don't like having to open up the pocketbook, um, they, want to they figured out a way around it. So, uh, it, and it entailed um, getting a whole bunch of material and then sending it overseas to be recorded so you didn't have any pesky musician union dues to pay or, or royalties to pay and, uh, and then just send it back and start putting it out there. So besides um, the people that... The composers that were just talked about, you had a bunch of others, uh, Spencer Moore, um, uh, George Hormel, or Jordy Hormel, George Hormel II, He's a, it's all the same person, um, uh, Ed Glinderman. Corn dog as a teenager. What's that? Hormel claimed to have invented the corn dog. Well, he, well, he, he is, uh, George Hormel was uh, part of the Hormel, you know, spam <laughs> uh, empire. Um, he, he was, in fact, it's probably, I would say, you know, he, look, he was well off. He was a well off musician, a band leader, and, um, and probably had people who could write this, you know, the, certainly if he had an orchestra, um, the leader of the orchestra could probably write this kind of like light motif music for him. So uh, he got the credit and he got the royalties, but um, there's nothing in his body of work that suggests he ever wrote orchestral music. He was like a jazz pianist. And that's, you know, if you look up George, Jordy Hormel or George Hormel II, um, most of his, you know, music is like that. It's more it's more like small ensemble jazz oriented. And, and yeah. here's this orchestral, you know, just, I mean, it's not just one or two LPs, it's dozens of them in all the libraries. So, you know, he had somebody behind the scenes who was just very prolific, like everybody else. Uh, but another guy is um, Les Baxter. Les Baxter yeah. is credited from, you know, a, you know, a, an amazing musician and composer and, did a lot of great stuff, but he's credited on so many soundtracks. Um, everything from, uh, I can't even, you know, it, it's just the, the breadth of the work when you get down to that he's credited for something like the movie Frogs, which is like all this like weird synthesizer, you know, doesn't really have a, um, you know, a traditional score. It's like a lot of like sound effects and kind of like swampy sounding, you know, atmospheric things. Uh, this just would not have been in his wheelhouse to do something like that, but his name is on it. So yeah. um, that's just kind of the carryover thing. The, the musicians who were at the top were the ones who could command some kind of power in the hierarchy of things. They're the ones who would get the money and the, um, or get the royalties. And then, and it, you know, there's nothing that even says, there's no evidence that Spencer Moore even played an instrument, um, let alone that he's, you know, credited on here. I think it was a bunch of money guys who got together and just put their names on stuff. So, um, 
you had uh, you had you know composers from all over the place, and then some composers who had these big pieces of the catalog that nobody had ever heard of them before, but they were the ones who were credited for it. So we've done our best to uh, <laughs> untangle it as much as possible. Um, what else could we say about the uh, the history there, John? Um, actually, I've got a quick question that I saw on that invoice. Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah, pull it up. It says date reference to July 31st. So I'm going to say that that's when Image 10 put in the invoice to to uh, use the music, correct? Right. Right. So, there's so where, where, do you see, uh, where do you see July 31st? Oh yeah, I see. Um, uh, yeah. Balance, yeah, balance forwarded. There is something. Um, uh, well, John. Yeah, John can. John has the letter. This, by the way, is from Marilyn's uh, scrapbook, and um, and then she yeah. also has a letter to, from Oli Gear, who was the administrator of Capital IQ at the time, and he's also a, a composer. Um, and he was writing under well, set of several pseudonyms. Um, well, well, I, there, I there's to, there's I some to correspondence there, but the, it's it's a uh, it's funny that um, she put this um, <laughs> this invoice in her scrapbook, and the very next page would have been the cue sheet. And if she had put the cue sheet in there, she would have Save saved all that time, a lot of time, <laughs> <laughs> at least for this person right here <laughs> and uh, that's not what happened but anyway john what what is the uh explain so, the letter on, between carl so and the, the interesting thing is in the in the first volume of the scrapbook it has the letter to carl and it has the invoice in the second version of the scrapbook it also has the letter from carl to uh, capital and let me just read to you a bit from that because i thought it was kind of interesting so this is from July 3rd, 1968. Uh, Dear Mr. George, concerning our telephone conversation of July 2nd regarding our use of capital high Q for the scoring of the theatrical motion picture entitled Night of the Living Dead, we herewith submit the attached list of selections for that purpose. Again, the list of selections is missing. The film is to be released at some as yet undetermined date between the 15th and the 31st of August, 1968. In this regard, we require worldwide licensing clearance by August 15th. Understanding it's $1,500 for the 90 minute running time. Due to certain complexities in our financial arrangements with the distributors of the film, we ask that you extend us a 60 day deferment on payment of the music, such term to commence from the licensing date. And then he adds, I may, I may say that we found HiQ most excellent for scoring of our film, plan to use it again on two feature films now in pre-production. So there was this timing thing. And when George wrote back to Carl, he said, we will date the covering invoice July 25th, closing date for our credit office books, and put it on a 60-day deferred payment, making it payable on or before September 25th. Now, I think you see the thing that Vince didn't pay it to like November 25th, There's a couple months late, um, assuming just right. the, the 68 is wrong. Um, yeah, he paid it before they made the movie. Yeah, he paid it. He paid it three years before they made the movie. That's interesting. But, but anyway, so yeah, that, I guess we could assume that that's uh, sixty-seven. Or I'm uh, sorry, sixty. It should be sixty-eight. And um, actually, I had I had that question from somebody else um, in autopsy. Well, this is just a similar thing, um, but a lot of the actor defer payments were deferred, including the extras. And um, ironically, it's, it was in a soundtrack forum. Somebody asked, um, you're, in your documentary, Autopsy of the Dead, it shows a um, check from El to Ella Mae Smith and Philip Smith for uh, $25. You know, they were paid for being ghouls. And, um, and why is it dated, you know, Night of Living Dead was made in 67, uh, but uh, they weren't paid until two years after because it was made in 67 it was the deal was made to distribute it which didn't happen until october 68 and they must have deferred payment from for everybody for another year after that 
um, which I, I would assume that they still weren't getting money from Walter Reed at that point, but uh, but they did pay everybody. So uh, there was a lot of like moving, uh, you know, deferred payments forward um, because the film was was basically made for, you know, just a, in terms of cash, a small portion of the was one hundred and fourteen thousand dollar budget. Most of it was in equipment that they, the latent image had acquired. So um, you're talking about really just the the expense of film and developing and Processing, yeah. whatever other uh, you know whatever other expenditures of you know making a film on location uh, that they were just kind of like um, you know doing it in guerrilla guerrilla filmmaking style, you know, sleeping at the location or things like that, you know. So um, I hope that answers your question there, John. Um, oh, mine? That, was, yeah. that actually wasn't the question, but I'll, I'll text you because <laughs> I got another one. I'll, I'll message you private. <laughs> in an area that we don't, don't need to get to, so let's okay. move forward. So, uh, is, anything else about the uh, the formulation of Capital IQ or its structure or something that I didn't cover? No, I think we're, you can think we're of? ready to get to some music. <laughs> okay, good. So, let's jump ahead to... Um, so, what we're going to do here is uh, StreamYard now has uh, music can play in the background, which is a huge plus because uh, we probably wouldn't be able to do this without without doing that so hooray for a stream yard um but we have all the cues and we're going to go through them um as they appear in the film but where uh, something becomes uh we have like a situation that warrants more explanation we will we will jump into that and that's going to take a little bit of time uh, I'll say, like, right up front, I doubt we're going to get through the entire film, so this will probably be Needle Drop Nightmares Part 1, um, and we will do Part 2 another time. But um, starting right off the bat, um, we do have a situation with the, uh, um, the music that is played at the opening crash from the first frame of film. going to turn that down so we can talk over it. Everybody's familiar with this, I'm sure. Um, so what's interesting that's happening here, you heard it has, uh, you could hear from the beginning of the cue, it has a very kind of standard, um, you know, orchestral or sort of small orchestra opening. But it and quickly... just, to, just to give this one a name, this is Eerie Heavy Echo. Yes. So, um, it quickly evolves into this very echoed, um, like very sparse arrangement to like allow room for the echo to keep repeating. And uh, it also sounds like the echo is kind of coming in and out in different parts. So like here, it's just like hitting one note and it kind of like continues. Um, this is a significant it's one of the most recognizable pieces of music you it, it, from the library that's used in night of living dead it's also a very old piece of music it would have been in, in films 10 years older so it was written at least 10 years before um but what's interesting what's to me very interesting about it is from the same reel of heavy echoed um tracks george also used the uh, or scored the scenes of the posse as well as the bonfire um, so it's just uh, let me just turn that off for a second uh, so we can talk about that and we're going to have some other examples here and just like how my computer hates when I do anything graphics well it's ending here so we'll let it end 
And that's also an interesting point, is that the entire Q plays, we're going to get to that in a second. John Vulo had some points about that and some questions. And uh, again, it just gives us uh, um, talking about those those instances when they come up, the entire cube playing as opposed to a piece of a cube. It just shows us how the movie was made and how George was putting the film together. But um, this reel from the, um, from the library, D24, um, it has seven tracks, se uh, six tracks, sorry, six uh, music cues, and they have um, all of this very heavily you know, processed echo to them. And um, funny enough, George uses them for the daylight scenes where and it's not just daylight, but it's um, the kind of expansive scenes where you're seeing like the scope of the Pittsburgh countryside, you know, the, whether it's the car driving through the, through the, um, uh, uh, the countryside or it's the posse guys walking and the helicopter coming in and all the, just these very broad shots. Um, uh, and then, you know, he continues with that for the bonfire for the, or the, the leading up to the bonfire, which is all those still images. Um, he just intuitively knew uh, that these were consistent with what he was trying to get across there. And, a little bit of history. Uh, which of the uh, John? Which of the uh, the videos um, would have that music? I guess teenagers from mm -hmm. outer space. The um, yeah, I think teenagers uses one of those cues, and the time element, the the first time element cue, uses the opening, minus the bombastic opening, which uh, and I was telling the guys that. I almost feel like it's sacrilege to say, but I almost think it's more effective to start the cue after that kind of dun dun dun, and you know just kind of yeah yeah. We, we were all we were all ball. discussing that. Um, uh, so yeah, the um, I I never thought those opening chords of the um, you know the cue that was used for the opening of Night Living that they really just don't fit and. Right one. Hold on a second. Which was uh, so this here. Hopefully, my mic is unmuted, but this here would be the um, from the same reel. D24, and it's the posse music, where the, the music, the music cue that scores the posse here, it's being used in the film The Time Element with uh, Martin Balsam. I don't know if I hear it. Okay, is it not playing? I, I'm, I'm oh. hearing it through us. Let me see if I can hear it through Facebook. Hmm. I heard no, it there for a second. No, it's, it's playing. So yeah, so this 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 cut has the the posse cue from this album. Um, right. Time element, as folks may or may not be aware, was Rod Serling's um, pilot, scenario, right? You, Mr. Jensen. Kind of like a pilot. Supposing for Twilight I were to go back in time, okay. and I would have behaved. So now. this would have been uh, what year? Now, Fifty-nine. If I went back in no, time. Fifty-nine. Killed, I shouldn't be living today. But the, uh, there's another time element clip, Jim, that's got the opening track. Let me stop that. Um, hold on a second. C continue discussing there, and let me see if I can find that. I think maybe I made a mistake and didn't download that. So hold on a second. Um, but yeah, so anyway, we were talking about those opening um, those opening chords, which to me sound very soap opera-ish, um, but uh, like I said, luckily the you know the film recovers quickly, and and <laughs> that doesn't bring everything to a screeching halt before it even gets started. It gets um, your attention, and then yeah. it 
and then it kind of does its thing. I was thinking but, uh, about it. I mean, you know, oh. uh, well, I was thinking about like that intro, and I said, well, it fits that scene. You know, the the, the cue plays right into the exact moment until uh, Russ and Barbara start speaking. So it had to have been cut the length of the that scene for that cue. I figured, yeah. well, maybe the reason why that intro the screws are there is maybe he could uh, George couldn't find like a good transition point to like start after the strings happen and then go right into it. Like it might not start in the right way. So I figured you know, instead of maybe him fixing it, because it has the whole thing there. The the way it's after that after the big bars. And then as you hear the, and then it kind of starts off into its more melodic piece is when the car shows up. So you, you might've lost yeah. that, you know, opening bit. Of course, you know, it's just a matter of, you probably could have cut, you know, the title sequence a little bit tighter. It's only, you know, a few seconds of. Uh, yeah. Well, let's, footage. so let's yeah. talk about that. That was a thing that John brought up and um, it's, so it's something where that was a, an aspect of, you know, how did, how was the movie, edited um, and it's something that I've always thought about um, I think in some cases so there's two trains of thought in some cases George had a scene that needed music and in other cases the music almost inspired the way the scene was cut so uh, the fact that uh, I, I highly doubt he went through the library and came up with um, cues that were you know how, how long is that opening cue a minute uh, it's two minutes and 20 seconds, I think. Two minutes, and okay. So, yeah, so he didn't, uh, um, yeah, he didn't. I highly doubt he just looked for like he had this opening sequence and he, um, <laughs> came up with cues that were two, you know, I, I better get something that fits two minutes and 20 seconds or else, you know, it's not gonna <laughs> work. It, you know, he liked what he heard and uh, literally the very first frame of the film is when that music starts and just as the car is rolling up and I would say well, like maybe a second or two before Barbara begins speaking that cue has faded down so I mean it fits that like a glove obviously he would have tweaked some things because he liked that um, and then cut those scenes together and then that would have been handed off or cut those shots together to make the opening and then that would have been handed off to add the titles over and they would have, you know, planned how they were going to do that. So, um, you know, from, from there, from uh, the shots that he had. Question. Does, uh, yeah. on the work print, the music spot, the, uh, what, did the work print have the music, but no dialogue? Well, no, the, uh, um, I'm to remember. well, that, you know, that's another, um, First of all, the work print is, I think, isn't the work print missing the very first? Oh, no, that's one of the mix down, uh, the pre-mixes. Um, the work print is missing a reel, but it's not the first one. The, no. the work print would be no. um, the, uh, the the picture and the soundtrack would have been spooled along with it. So there's separate elements. And at some when they got those to lock, and it's the way that, you know, they you know, George being the editor, the way he would have wanted it. And he got all the, the music cues and the, you know, the boards being nailed, all the hammer noises and the footsteps and the, you know, the trowel stabbings and all that stuff. When he got that all in place, the way he wanted it, they would have been like great, but they would have taken those individual um, stems of the, uh, you know, the, the audio, the different reels of audio, and they would have done a mix down because now it's in sync with the picture. And they, they would have done what's called an answer print, which is the, the first um, combination of picture and audio to make sure it all works. When they get that the way they want it, then they can form the negative. And then they work off of whatever mixes of the tapes, you know, that they have. And then that's actually that's eventually used to make the film prints. So, um, and and on all uh, and on, on all those versions, the music starts on that first frame because I have a weird memory of seeing a version where the music doesn't start 
on the first frame. There's a little bit, but I don't know if that means it was just like a freeze frame that they used and then started it afterwards. I would um, be willing to bet that there are, you know, with so many VHS and you know versions of Night out there. Yeah, well, that's are, yeah. You know, transfers from a 16 millimeter print that you know had that that first bit, maybe even up to the Image 10 logo cut off, and so the film basically starts, you know, with the other part of the music. Um, but so, more so yeah, the uh, um, mm. the uh, Night of the Living Dead uh, in VH or in home video, it changed so many times. There's ones where it fades in. I had like an, the way that I first can see the complete film was I had to get a Super 8 print in the I guess 1980, 1981, and um, because other otherwise watching on TV it was edited. So the first time I could see a complete was to actually buy a Super 8 print. And I always like notice the you know I noticed the real changes you know then you're actually holding a film and, and, it, and it had five reels and I was um, really pleased to find that the you know when we got the actual negative and inspected it at the Museum of Modern Art it matched my old Super 8 <laughs> you know print exactly um, so you know the real one ended where you know the negative actually ended so. That was all cool, and um, uh, I remember little anom anomalies with that um, that print. Like the very first frame was actually I, I don't know what would have caused this. They made a mistake when they were transferring. Like John said, probably a the Super Eight was probably made from a sixteen um, original, and then they you know just you know made a Super Eight negative from that, and then. Um, made their prints, you know, all different companies were making it because of the public domain nature. Um, my very, the very first frame was like overexposed. And I thought maybe the, uh, the actual film was like that. And, the, and it was like that in several other scenes, like the very first cutaway to, in the basement when you see Helen's corpse with the trowel sticking out was an overexposed frame. And it's like, why would it be like that in the middle of a, of a reel if, uh, you know, unless somebody goofed somewhere? So I thought the original film was like that. And I always made little notes about things. And, and then when home video came along and, and you had, uh, you know, and it wasn't home film, it was home video. And then you had the different companies trying to mask maybe defects in the version that they had. Then the film started fading in. The bonfire would fade in. There was all these different things. Some scenes were tighter than they than they were when you were watching an actual film print. So there was all kinds of stuff like that going on. Um, but to go back to the point is the, the opening scene, I think, is one where George was inspired by the music. Now we're going to have examples where he definitely cut the scene first and the music and he just happened to find or you know again through his skill because i think there's too many accidents where the or happy accidents where the music just is so right for the scenes that he's that he's uh, scoring um uh, you know there's parts where he just uses a piece of a cue because it's a very long cue and the scene isn't as long but it's a very well crafted scene where he would have had to you know there may be something without dialogue where he would have had to like, you know, build momentum and build a, a mood. And he found the music that just fit with that. But it, it's not so much inspiring the scene. It just, when you put the two together, they just work really well. So um, we do have that clip, it should be uploaded now. Uh, let's take a look at that. Uh, so this is an example. Well, the time element's actually pretty good, but we'll also go to Teenagers from Outer Space. Um, as an example of how you don't use library music effectively. Um, here is the opening of uh, Rod Serling's The Time. Once upon a time, there was a psychiatrist named Arnold Gillespie and a patient whose name was Peter Jensen. Mr. Jensen walked into the office nine minutes ago. It is 11 o'clock, Saturday morning, Saturday morning October, 4th, October 4th, 1958. 58. It is perhaps chronologically trite to be so specific about an hour and the date, but involved in this story is a time element. Yeah, they had the, the music mixed down for the voiceover, but you could just kind of hear the, the buildup of the, 
the Q. Oh, Jim, you're muted. Both you guys are muted. Here we go. Can you hear me now? Yep. So um, in that opening clip of the time element, they, they've they cut those opening chords of the... Uh, yes. You know, the very loud chords. So, yeah, they're just using the, the spacey... The kind of build up. ...part of it, you know, um, for kind of like atmosphere. Something something weird is going on, you know, to, to imply that, um, it's the kind of the same thing with teenagers from outer space. And I want to get John V's take on this in a second, but, um, this, the opening to teenagers from outer space is quite long. We're not going to get into the entire thing, but, um, this to me is not <laughs> how you cut, uh, library music. I'm sorry, John, go ahead. Before, cause I still didn't really hear the audio from before. Would it be a pain in the butt if I like exited and came back? Maybe it's some weird audio issue because I heard it before. But, uh, but what not, is I'll the, just, uh, just... Yeah, um, I'll pull you out of the chat when I see you come back in. You know, when I see you log back in, uh, see if that works. It, it could be just your um, your system is bogged down like mine is. I'm not hearing this stuff very well at all, so. Um, maybe the, the audio is fine. Yeah. And it's, okay. You know, uh, it's messed up, but all right. Yeah, because uh, so yeah, let gonna, me you're gonna... uh, exit. I'll be back in two seconds. All right. Oh. Well, John refreshes. Greg was asking if we were going to discuss the music yeah. in the trailer. And uh, do you, do you know anything about the music that was in the trailer, Jim? I don't. Yeah. The um. So the music from the the music in the trailer. Tra yeah. Well, the music in the trailer is not at least from what I know is not capital IQ that would have been, um, cut by continental, um, which is, you know, who, they, they were the distributor. Um, so they're piecing together. I mean, obviously it's a custom voiceover, you know, cause it's tailored to the film, but I think they just pulled bits and pieces of, you know, that kind of, uh, very fast, you know, piano, dun -dun 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 -dun, and then like some strings and, um, just a bizarre chord, you know, night, yeah, night doo -doo 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 -doo, of the living dead, you know, so, um, yeah, that's a, you know, that would just be a different, um, I'm sure none of that was recorded for the trailer, but we have John's back. Um, but yeah, the, I, I would assume that that was just another brand of library music just cut in there and also not, extremely effective as well and it just lacks nuance you know and, and that's what we're going to get into here with teenagers from outer space so you know um ironically one of the ideas for the film that eventually became night of the living dead was to have teenagers from outer space um basically going at it with the local you know kind of you know rednecky sheriff um uh, so it's just funny that you know we're talking about a movie called Teenagers from Outer Space as, as kind of like the benchmark of how not to cut library music into your movie. But you can hear right off the bat they're using the posse cue from Night of Living Dead. And this movie would be a good 10 years before Night of Living Dead. Um, Dr. May and that Dr. cue May is just being used to like signify, you know, mystery and suspense and or whatever tension. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, I guess it was not the sudden light replacement. Oh, over just a very ordinary no a <laughs> room, um, scene no, of you know a, a observatory and evolving. No, it must have been my imagination. It makes me realize how desperately alone it is. Hanging in space like a speck of food floating in the ocean. Sooner or later to be swallowed up by some creature floating by. Oh, come now. Time will tell, Dr. Mason. I'm getting a bit of a only wait and wonder. Not wonder how. Makes teenagers from outer space. Wonder when. <laughs> Could that be uh, somebody's um, speaker? I 
here we could, you can hear um, another Night of Living with you. Again, very, very heavy-handed use of, like, a suspense or uh, whatever you would want to call that, you know, a very heavy tension. credits frightening <laughs> I mean we're looking at a you know a flying saucer that you know would have been everybody's idea of a flying saucer or an alien craft and then trigger warning no dogs were harmed in the making of this movie yeah <laughs> this, this music always foreshadows something bad happening right right <laughs> kill the dog kill Ben and then they're right back to the queue that they started with. Right. But yeah, just use the opening queue from night for the point of coming out of the saucer. And then, you know, for aliens, I mean, they don't look very alien. <laughs> so... You would figure that they would at least get, you know, act, maybe actors who weren't Anglo-Saxon, <laughs> you know, who weren't or so lavish. <laughs> yeah, their their teenagers aren't don't actually look very teenagery. And so this is interesting right here. This is a cue that um, is not a Night Living Dead, but it's from the same reel. Uh, this D24 that has all this echoey music. And um, it, it's the cue that was mistakenly Include credited Robbie. as being the, the, the posse music, which, it, which, it, which it's not. And the reason is, on the very Saraband soundtrack release, and the reason it's miscredited is because on the cue sheet it's miscredited because the numbers are just off by a few so if you again we were talking about those uh, track uh, codes that they use to identify um, these track titles that are all very similar or, or if not exactly the same okay, it's, the, it's the code that is how they identified everybody that was written down so when Gary Saraband, I would assume, ac accessed the cue sheet, they just stuck all of those, you know, those cues as were written, and it's incorrect. <laughs> when you were playing this before, I was laughing. It's funny that you mentioned it because it was, I was laughing how bad it was, how bad the music just doesn't, like, fit. And, uh, I actually, I'm a big Mystery Science Theater fan, and I was familiar with this movie because they did it on uh, Mystery Science Theater, and I was so disappointed that they did not mention any of the, that music being from Night of Living Day because it was, it was so obvious. But uh, right. it's it's like like you said, it's a completely ham-fisted way of using that library music. It's something from space, you know, flying saucers. We have this echoey music, you know, the science fiction space stuff. We'll just throw it in there without any regard for uh, any of the nuance that you're kind of seeing on screen, although it's just, you know, just a, the poor sci-fi thing. And that's what you were saying, what makes it, what makes George's, I guess, inherent talent that he didn't know that he had, like, so special of taking these uh, cues, which aren't really supposed to be used for those scenes, but actually make them make those scenes so much more effective because like with that one of the 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 issues i think that the bad things about that opening cue uh in night is you don't really get in my opinion how great it is until the movie's over because 
you first hear, you know, that bombastic string thing, and then once it settles in, it makes you feel like just something in the air isn't right. You know, like it's Earth, but just it's not Earth. Something's but, going on. Well, he uses the uh, he uses the uh, like we're talking about differences here between good use of the library or effective yeah. use of the library music and, and highly ineffective use or very cheesy. Uh, yeah. it, it's the same music. But um, the, the first thing is um, George uses the entire cue. He, he lets it play out. You know, we, like we, we just saw about four minutes of teenagers from outer space. They used what, like three or four cues in there cut up into pieces. Yeah. So you're not really getting, you know, what was the point of that? I mean, they could have found a, you know, a three minute cue and a, and a two minute cue and used some combination and just space them out a little bit more. But um, but they didn't do that, and you're only getting these little bits and pieces, and it just doesn't. Uh, um, it, to me, that uh, that entire train of thought does not work well. Uh, if you if you watch the movie a little bit, you know more. Um, you know, I suggest people watch it because, again, it's it's a, it's like a, a class on how not to use library music. But uh, whenever there's a chase, you know, it immediately goes to chase music. Whenever it's it, there, you see a, like a big city, it immediately goes to that, you know, cliche, you know, da -da 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 -da, that that uh, that is supposed to, um, you know, make us think about the hustle and bustle the of bustle, the, big the city. bustling big city. You know, yeah, it's, it's you know, so they're just going for the very cliche things all the time. You have a spaceship on screen, or you're of course you're going to use something that's uh, uh, you know that sounds like outer space. Um, whereas George is just using in Night Living Dead the, the the countryside, you know, just scenes of the countryside, and, and he's using the cue to kind of suggest like isolation almost, and uh, or or further the point of ice. You see the lonely car on the on the road, and so he's just furthering that point of isolation. Yeah, um, it's, just, it's just brilliantly used to really set the tone of kind of what you're going to see. And that's why I said it's almost more effective after you see the movie and watch it. Yeah. And then, as we were saying, he, so he goes back to um, uh, the opening track of Night Living Dead. As I said, D24 is a six cues, music cues. The opening track is number four. Um, the third track, which is Three. this one, L -12 is the 16. posse music. And there, and there you hear, that's how they um, identify the music. They have a little identifier between each cue. But this would be the, the posse music, and the, if you recall how the posse scene starts, it starts with some, um, you know, just, uh, we've been primarily in the movie through the night. You know, all the scenes are very dark. And now you're seeing you know daylight you're seeing some shots of trees and things look more peaceful there's no ghouls in sight and when the helicopter goes by that's when this starts and then you start seeing the the uh, posse members you know which just look like farmers or uh, guys with you know toting rifles just walking through a field um, and again it's this kind of like uneasy music but the whole movie's had uneasy music. What's different about this is it's very spacey. So it's almost like when uh, George is showing you in the movie when he's when he's got scenes that are brightly lit and it just looks like the countryside, he's saying there's something wrong here. Um, just with a little bit of nuance, you know. Not he's not going. He's not going full out like the beginning of Teenagers from Outer Space. You know, the saucer opens and ah, you know, you have all this uh, <laughs> just crazy stuff going on. So, um, what, what, what I was, uh, I pretty much agree with what what you were saying. There's no also like there's no real pulse, so it's it really adds to the like eeriness and creepiness to what you just saw. And then it's almost like right. the next day, this kind of sobering uneasiness. And I actually uh, wrote because I you sent, you sent me the whole thing. I thought that uh, 1203 would also mm -hmm. be good to be used. Like if you played that 
to think about how that morning shot would be used, and it actually almost works, but right. because it like it, there's more movement to the base where it's just duh, duh, duh. It really does. It's not nearly as eerie or creepy as that one. So I think what's so that, like, that, that's what I was going to ask you about, and, and that's frankly why I brought you on here because you know music. <laughs> Uh, theory much better than I do and can, can explain it. Um, so these two cues are near each other, and the one that you're talking about is the error posse cue, the one that was attributed to Night of the Living Dead on the Barry Saraban um, LP, and it's the second track on this reel, and we'll two, play it. L1203. Um, it's just the difference of a couple numbers why it was... Um, it didn't, uh, it, it ended, you know, it ended up on the cue sheet when it's not used in the film. So we have kind of like a dissonant opening there. And then we have, as you're saying, this kind of march, you know, this, uh, yeah. this stepped bass or walking bass. I'll turn it up a bit. So we have. Well, that would be like some strings and maybe some high woodwinds kind of yeah. uh, echoed. It's even like even right at this point, you can get that uneasy feeling, but right. that bass is just pushing it too far. And I guess that's why they got confused because it also could work. It's just not as effective as the other one. Right. So that's what I wanted to ask you about it. You're saying that. Because the other one is more, and, and then we have this. It doesn't really has kind of, yeah, it doesn't, it wouldn't fit that. So that's probably, you know, what we're talking about here is George had this reel. We're listening to the, we're listening to these tracks that would be like the alternates on that reel that he wouldn't have choose, he wouldn't have chosen. Um, why didn't he choose this one? Well, you hear some of the things. It, it breaks into this kind of shrieking. I don't know, like interlude in the middle of all the kind of the creepy walking of the, of the bass line. So yeah. um, that was maybe the big turnoff. That's why he didn't do it. But uh, I think what you're saying, John, is that as these tracks get busier and they have more almost like conventional um, parts in them, it loses that alien feel of like yeah. the, more, the more spacey quality. And sometimes you want that. There are right. instances that we'll get to that I think fit really well with that. For something where you're just setting that bed of uneasiness, you really want that stillness, that kind of like uh, desolate kind of sound. And you don't really get that. And even like this ending here. Yeah. That's like discovering something. Like like you discovered some monument like in the middle of space. You know? Right. It's, yeah, it's too, uh, um, it's too much of a flourish. And... and I, I've really never, I've never um, mapped it out, but it seems that George also uses the entire posse cue. So that was the cue that he did use for the posse. He uses the entire thing. He may have even looped a piece of it again. So yeah. that just shows that he could get the most out of it and use more of it. Whereas this cue that we just listened to, there were some effective parts, but then there were other parts that would just be out of place and you know, it would work for something else. So, yeah. and again, uh, <laughs> Teenagers from Outer Space decides to put that cue in the opening um, without any, like, rhyme or reason why they would cut into that, you know, that cue. So, again, it's just like a the example we're talking about in I Living Dead, there was a, obviously a thought put into it, and Teenagers from Outer Space, it seems like they just went yeah. by the cue names. Uh, there's another cue on here. Um, so that's, a. Uh, we just went through cues two, three, and four. Q5 also could possibly fit on uh, Night of the Living Dead. Um, where is it? Hold on one second. And then uh, Q6, um, I'll play that Six. while we L while I look for the other. 15. Q6 is the final um, cue that's used in... Oops, no, it's not. Hold on a second. That's an old cartoony. 
<laughs> yeah, you could you could see why George didn't use that well, one. It's, that's actually a mechanical cue. If we play that one, I do have I do have a, a, th a little a blurb on that. But we could do it now, or you could do it later. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. Let's. Uh, let me first play the cue that I was talking about, which is um, the end of the the end of the film. Twelve fourteen. Which one should that be, John? Twelve fourteen. L twelve fourteen. Hmm. Why don't I have that? Hold on one second. Um, everybody's familiar with this one. Yeah. Yeah, there's nothing like uh, stumbling around looking for a poorly labeled music cue while everybody. Greg reading. says, so here we go. The first cue is rubato without regular time. Yes. So that's the uh, the the opening used in the film. You said it's a uh, twelve fourteen, right? L twelve fourteen. Yes. Yes. That's okay. after Ben is shot. So, um, and actually, it's not the only cue used in the film or at the end of the film. There's also a stinger that they put over the bonfire, bonfire. but we'll talk about that later. That, that's yeah. something that George would have, uh, it only exists on Night of Living Dead. He would have manipulated some something to, to make that sound. But um, I have it loading in here. I think something had maybe written over that cue, which is why I didn't put it or didn't have it handy here. And I just want to check really quick if, let me see, D24. So actually, I was correct. D twenty four is seven. It is seven cues. So they would have had this. Um, this is the last one. L twelve fourteen. Everybody's familiar with it. It's kind of. I, what would be the instrumentation here, John? Just be like a few strings, like maybe almost like the like four or six high strings, like violins, and they're. Yeah just playing these chords that they kind of pull out of the end so that the echo can carry it over. So yeah. it's a very sparse arrangement, but it's but it's interesting. George scores, you know, very powerful um, end credit, you know, scene, yeah. which is basically the audience is in shock from the hero being killed. I mean, yeah. literally, he's just been killed that came out of like nowhere and this music starts in yeah and I, um here here's another example that was the entire cue and so george had to loop it twice nice. in order to fit that um you know that sequence but it's uh and then there is there's a little bit of uh i have the other it's funny i didn't bit. even notice that i replayed it's like oh it's shorter than i remember <laughs> yeah so that makes sense yeah, it only goes um, well, it goes half great. as long. It's great too the way he they continue to run um, sound effects and dialogue over it too. Yes, so you get you know the chatter and uh, they like these stories. There's like a um, that's what I'm looking for. Like almost like a I can't think of the right word. If I if I remember the right word, I'll hold <laughs> it. But there's like a sir like feel that having them talk through it like nothing happened like makes it more depressing you know it's like almost clinical like ah we're gonna move this and whatever and like like no one knows like you're the only person that saw what happened and they didn't see right. it at all so they're just going about their day like nothing happened but you just yeah, saw there's the all that there's all that walkie talkie chatter yeah. over the over the string swelling and they keep going back to ben and the you know, like the unceremonious way he has like a meat hook put into him and he's just kind of dragged out. Um, yeah. 
unceremonious. Yeah, all, all those things play really well. The, we were talking about that the other night. There's several scenes where that kind of stuff happens. There's music, but there's also the, there's the hectic kind of chatter of the radio playing over certain things, and that adds to you know the background. Like once the radio's turned on, this kind of like incessant you know chatter of the radio and it's like it's getting more urgent and more um you know it's it sounds like the the newscaster is starting to like come apart that he's you know as he's getting worse and worse news to report um that, yeah, and he takes like longer pauses and things and but it's just, it's interesting how um it no longer becomes a radio but it becomes almost like a sound effect that's yeah. heightening the mood that's trying to be created here um, and uh, you were, oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, and, uh, to, again, to add to like George's brilliance with using that cue, like I wrote, that's uh, an excellent uh, cue for the finale because it just, just hearing the strings by themselves, that it really gives that like hopeless kind of feel that you get. Like you were watching this movie, you were rooting for this character, and then this terrible thing happened that you witnessed, and there's nothing that you could have done to prevent it. You're just sitting there watching it, and I think that's the just the the lone use of just some strings really plays into that. And you know, all these cues are more for like space, like you know, oriented things. And like this particular cue, I can kind of see like maybe a guy's floating out in space by himself, like he like you know lost contact with the ship, or you know what I mean. And he's just alone because all these tracks that echo, echoey feeling, why it works for space is that desolate, isolated kind of sound and the kind of vibe that it gives. And George is using that here in a different way, but still maintaining the integrity of what that music was kind of written for, if that makes any sense. So this ending is probably the, aside from maybe one other part that we'll get to, I think this is probably the most effective cue in the movie. And it's so simple, but I think it's really strong. And do you think, my question would be, do you think that simplicity, I mean, they're not even playing, those strings, correct me if I'm wrong, or if I'm not hearing it right, but they're not really even playing chords, right? No, they're just, just kind uh, of all, they're playing like a note in unison, and they're yeah. kind of like going up to another note, and then they're yeah. allowing, and then they trail off quickly to allow the yeah. echo to carry it, so, but it's not like, it's not like we could point to it as being like a major or minor chord, or even outlining I a think major it's a minor, or minor chord. Just off the top of my head, I think it's a minor third. It's a minor third. Yeah. And then that right. moves up chromatically, just a little. Right. But once again, so, that more somber kind of sound, minor, not happy. Yeah, just uh, uh, so for the non non musicians, um, you know, major. Um, major chords, major scales are generally upbeat and happy, and minor is the sad sounding stuff. And in this case, um, if they're if you're correct, it's like a chromatic note. Chromatics tend to be very uneasy and chaotic sounding, especially when you establish something solid like a major third, a minor third. So if they're playing a, a minor interval, it means they're going up a minor third, and that's going to sound sad. But you then push that a little more chromatically, that's going to sound really <laughs> messed up. And so that's why it's effective. But I, I was going to say, so you think it's because it's that, uh, that sparseness, that this, the simplicity of it is what makes it effective and yeah. why he would have, why he would have chose the, the, the simpler thing over the more complicated one. Yeah. It's very lonely. It's very empty. Like I said, it's like you're, you, you're watching this character that you're rooting for and then just out of nowhere, gets killed and you're left with that empty kind of sinking feel and what like i said with the credits and all the walkie talkie stuff those characters don't know anything that just happened only right. you as the audience watched this character that you know showed all this bravery and all this stuff and ended up just dying in a, in a very unfortunate way and it, i think it really struck if it was too busy if it was too sappy i don't think it would work it makes it sound very right empty lonely like i said you watch this thing happen it's like if you were a bystander and you saw this awful thing happen you know you would feel sympathy for that person but and there's nothing you could have done to help them you just had to witness it and that's what i think 
that cue really does as you, the audience, you know, watch it. There's nothing you could have done. It's a very hopeless kind of feeling, and that's it. Super effective. Yeah, and it's so simple. How does that uh, play into, so you wanted to talk about the, the, the cue that we're going to play right now is the is the one, so the cue for the bonfire, you know, this very sparse, hopeless sounding cue is the very last one on the reel, number seven. Mm -hmm. But then it's preceded by this. Why would George have gone right by this one? Six, L1215. It's interesting, it just doesn't fit Night of the Living Dead. I mean. Well, I think, like, obviously there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of different instrumentation. There's also uh, the trumpets. But, like, the trumpets right now are giving a sense of tension, like something sort of going on. If I think if you kind of put a gun to George's head and say, where could this be used? I think the best placement for something like this would have been when the ghouls start getting into the house when Ben gets there. Right. If you think about it, because it's like, what's going on? They're coming from all over the place. It's not. It's, there's a sense of confusion to it, and there's a sense of tension. But it, and it's busy enough with all these quick action shots and stuff. But like ultimately, the track that they did use, I think, gives the same point. It just does it much better. It's not nearly as like it's kind of goofy and kind of silly. But just a different thing. Yeah. This this one has like a tinge of like comedy to it. Yeah, I think and, I think and it just doesn't really work as yeah. So yeah, that's the uh, and the um the very first cue doesn't have any of that have you know that echo on it. It's uh, just a very mechanical sounding. Is it, but that one sounds the same. It's kind of like a uh, it sounds like a machine or a factory or like something's going yeah, on yeah. and but yeah there is like some dissonance and some easy uneasiness that's going on it just doesn't really fit night of living dead i like the the idea that well if you put a gun to george's head and said you had to use it it might work in the when the ghouls yeah. are coming into the house it's really funny because uh on the uh um that uh D4142, the, the disc label that we were looking at, um, that has like a lot of like very melodic, um, the, you know, the cemetery ghoul uh, pursuit is on that, on that one. And so is the uh, tension cue when they unboard the door. And, you know, there's a lot more to those cues than the, uh, than the you know, these, these more sparse ones. But there is a cue on there that starts out very like very like uh just dripping with tension but then it resolves to like not really happiness but like a relaxation and i always i always joked um that uh you know maybe i'll pull the cue out for the next time i always joked to myself that if night of living dead had a happy ending that's the cue you would use because it, it builds up Ben coming out of the cellar and the posse guys getting ready to shoot him uh, with all the tension, but all of a sudden it resolves to happiness. Like what if Vince had put his rifle down and <laughs> thought about it for a second and then, and then Ben came running out and he embraces those guys and they all kind of like, you know, get into a Jeep and ride off or something, you know? And that's, yeah. And that's what the, the key sounds like. It, it's not really, uh, it's not really, like completely goofy like how some of those movies would end in the 50s but it does have like this kind of release of tension and uh, and that things are going back to normal feel and that just would have been really funny to you know do a couple maybe edits um to night of the living dead and reshoot a few things and just put a happy ending to see how it would come out <laughs> well and start well, with that cue who knows totally if they 
if they listened to uh, Columbia, whoever the original distributors were going to be, and they said, we want the happy ending, and then George just said, instead of saying no, just said, sure. Who knows? Yeah, that, sure. might have, that, might have, that would have been the one that was used. <laughs> if, and probably if it went to Columbia, it would have had a copyright on it, and then none of us would be here. So, um, yeah. <laughs> But anyway, so um, <laughs> it took us... play uh, Eerie Mechanical? Uh, is that the very first one? Yeah. Okay, so this is what this is how that reel starts. And we're not going to do this for all D24. the twenty-four zero level. Oh well, for, yeah. First, we've got the um, tone. <laughs> they do this for the they do tones for the um, the setting of levels. In the studio, I'll turn that down so we don't One, hear it. L five twenty four. So now, so, I would say, if this once again had to be used somewhere, <laughs> I would use this uh, to win the the game. Go to the truck and go to the gas pump. That's funny. For me, for me I was going to say this would be Bill chasing Harley. Say what? With Bill chasing Harley in the cemetery? Yes. Oh, yeah. Because. It's got that kind of. Yes. Yeah. For me, the reason why I said the truck one, because there's a lot more going on. There's a lot more characters doing different things, and you do have that, and this is where it's different from, you want that bed of sparseness to, like, sober up the day, the, the morning of what happened the night before. You don't want almost any feeling of rhythm. Whereas something like this, where it's pulsating, really gives you that tension, anxiety, and it almost sounds like the ghouls are walking towards you. So that's why I thought it might work for something like that better, because there's more going on. You know, and I think it might have actually worked decent. It's just too short. Yeah. You know, and even I think I wrote the ending could even fit the truck exploding a little bit, but maybe just a little too short. Well, he, uh, uh, George, um, he, he's of two minds in the truck escape scene. Because if you notice, well, it's, it's pre-explosion and then post-explosion. Pre-explosion, where I guess there's going to be some dialogue, he uses a couple cues to generate different feels, and then he even cuts one short with a stinger that he used previously for the Molotov cocktails hitting. Um, but then when the truck explodes, he then goes to this very long cue that he even recycles you know, the ending again. And it goes through the whole thing, the fist fight, you know, getting back into the house, boarding up the door, the fist fight. And then he uh, even delays the ending to get like the last punch of the fist fight to like to pull the music away. So, so you hear that, you know, and uh, and then he and then Ben says the line, you know, I don't drag you out there and feed you those things. And then he puts the final. Yeah, done, 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 done. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. That's, uh, uh, but yeah, that's an interesting take. Cause that, so that cue we just heard, I mean, it, it doesn't have the echo. Uh, it's got the very heavy brass that's like plodding along, very similar to the cemetery ghoul, you know, chasing Barbara. Uh, but it's got all that pi that chaotic piano playing yeah, kind of extra really not, really not like, a, you know, any kind of like, uh, um melody it's playing a lot of like chaotic chromatic um you know little flourishes like and and, and very like it has like a very stabbing quality like the person's mm -hmm. really banging on those keys to like get that out of a piano so um it, it's it's two cool little things like working together there it, and i agree it would it would make sense to have like the brass um the brass is like thematic of the ghouls coming closer and closer. Whereas like the chaotic piano is like trying to like get the lock open on the gas, yeah. you know, the gas yeah. pump and get the, get get yeah. the nozzle into the, into the uh, truck, which uh, Tom fails at 
splendidly. Well, that, that's why I was I was uh, asking about how you know George would have put this together, and I would imagine he would listen to these uh, LPs and sort of write like this could be good here, this could be good here, this could be good yeah. here. So instead of having one choice, he's got multiple, and then puts them together and go, yeah, this one's not bad, but this one's just much better. Yeah, I I, I would have to wonder how many um, how many things were changed that way. Like he had a piece in there, and I'm sure I'm sure everything didn't go in on the first try. And it's like, yep, that's it. I'm sure some stuff was moved around. So it would be interesting to know, like which, um, you know, other choices would would have been made. But I mean, he literally was, you know, isolated, cutting this movie by himself. And so that th those would only be things that George Romero would know and would have known at that time. Um, I'm sure he would have, you know, forgotten it all. Um, just like, you know, if if you're a musician and you played something 20 years ago, you you don't remember. You, you could remember at the time maybe being intensely working on it, and there may you may have gone in like a few different directions, but you're not going to remember all those little nuances and the and the outtakes and the and the other things that you did, unless you had a a, a you know a an audio recording of it. That you could listen back to it would bring back you know why you made the choices that you did and i, I could i could be wrong but george doesn't doesn't seem like the time to sort of keep extensive notes and journals about no absolutely like not <laughs> that doesn't help the yeah. process either yeah but i think the other thing to keep in mind is that you know compared to today when you could literally say let me try this cue now let me try this one let me yeah. stretch it out let me adjust it it was such a cumbersome thing. Um, I could see like with the opening, if he thought, I like this track, I like it its entirety, I'm going to cut the opening to that. You know, you right. kind of make that decision. But when you get to some of the things in the film where it's like the window attack is a great example where there's, right. you know, a couple cues kind of worked to fit that scene. Um, but if you think just the labor involved in doing multiple iterations and and threading that up and you know getting it in sync and everything it's like obviously there's going to be motivation to you know minimize the amount of thrashing you do um but again well, the end result is so strong you have that quote that was excellent uh that that uh that george that, that i talked uh was telling you about that's like i had all the, a lot of the questions that i had seemed like you know, th this might have answered it, of course, if he was remembering everything correctly or not. But I believe in, in that quote, it says something like he extensively uh, auditioned, I think was the word, I could be wrong, uh, you know, the tracks with the scenes, I guess, with the, the needle drops by saying, okay, I'm going to put this in here. Let me put this in there. So I think he said uh, in that quote that they were listening to those records for months I don't know if that's true or not, but I'd imagine it seems like what he's trying to convey is he spent a lot of care and time listening to what would fit the movie the best. Yeah, this is this is from uh, an, an interview he did for a book called Unusual Sounds, A Hidden History of Library Music. And yes. he says that Carl and I spent days, weeks, months, you know, there's some room for exaggeration there. <laughs> listening to tracks. I pulled out musical candidates and would bring them back to my editing room to audition them against scenes in the film. I constructed a score that I believed to be not only cohesive, but supportive of the film's narrative. I think that I, with Carl's help, pulled passages from those library tracks that served our film almost as well as if we had been able to hire a composer. And I think you know, we're all in agreement with that. And, oh, yeah. and the, the uh, um, even though he had, George had a, uh, he had an idea of cohesion among the music. I, I don't think he even understood that he bookended the cues or bookended the film with cues that are basically from the same family. And yeah. so, kind of, you know, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. a great a, way of it doing wasn't a that. Premeditated, you know. Yeah, he just used what worked, but it, it created that cohesion. Um, let's let's go ahead. So the stuff that we just listened to and we're not going to do this for all of these uh, but that was a uh you know that so much came from that one uh real um and they're very um 
they're not only very um, memorable in terms of being Night of the Living Dead music, but that they were also used many times before in all these like really cheeseball films like Teenagers from Outer Space. Um, just says so much about that, so that's why we wanted to talk about that reel. But that reel was composed by Spencer Moore. It's the only one that's like it. A reel D23 has, which is also Spencer Moore, has similar things. This is how the library worked. They would put, they would gang similar cues together or group them on reels frequently or more often than not from the same composer. They, they really weren't multiple composers on any reel, any one reel. There's a few examples of that, but, but not very much. The rule of thumb would have been, you know, one composer, one reel, both sides of the, of the tape of the uh, LP. So, um, uh, like I said, I highly doubt Spencer Moore wrote any of that or it sounded very experimental and it sounded like something that just the, you know, was done during that one recording session and that's the stuff that worked and so they put it on a uh, they packaged it on a reel the uh, the next cue that happens uh, it, the soundtrack now becomes more traditional and um this is when after johnny and barbara's scene um johnny turns off the radio and exits the car and they start walking towards the grave and this this entire cue plays out literally starts as he turns off the radio yeah and uh, that was the thing that i noticed listening to it that little um the strings start in but there's that little tinkle on the piano that really like just kicks it off i mean this could have easily just faded in but instead it like starts abruptly and uh george uses that really well with the clicking off of the radio and then the cue begins And so this cue... Wait. Why do we start so late? Right, so I it's want to point early. out, um, this is a uh, um, one of the few, there's not a whole lot of them, but the JB cues in the, in the uh, library. And um, it's credited to William Luce. It would be a William Luce cue, but it doesn't have the same code as most of his other cues. And I was told that um, it was actually written by Jack Cookerley, um, who is still alive. He was one of the few composers from Capital IQ and who, whose work was in Night of Living Dead. He was still living. But uh, he's not credited anywhere. So he would have been uh, working at Capital or working together with, with William Luce and being paid, but he's not being credited. So he's not you know, being paid royalties when this is played. But the significance of the JBQ is Jack and Bill, and that's what was explained to me. And there's almost all of the other, uh, as I mentioned before, the William Luce, John Seeley cues or owned cues are TC, which is theme craft, and there's a lot of them. And, it's, and it also includes the uh, stuff that was written by David Rose, but he's not credited for that. There's very few JBQs. So... That definitely says that, yeah, there was something going on there. There was somebody else involved, and it turns out it was Jack Hookerly. And um, what's interesting about this is on the LP that it's on, it's a short cue, and the LP has a lot of short cues on it. Um, we jump ahead to when Barbara reaches the farmhouse, and the very next cue on the LP uh, scores that. And why can't I find it? JB37? Yeah, for oh, I'm missing it. An interesting thing Rats. about Jack, <laughs> Jack Cookerley is um, he created le unique electronic sounds and developed many of his own instruments, yes. contributing electronic effects to many science fiction films in the 50s and 60s, including Black Scorpion, Hit the Dare from Beyond Space, and that's what we talked about in our kind of precursors to Night of the Living Dead, Invisible Invaders. Right. It's and he, he, he did a very early uh, 
he's responsible for a very early synthesizer um, that he explained was built in a milk crate. <laughs> Just put the guts into a milk crate. Uh, John, you said that's a JB37, right? JB37, light suspense. Okay, it's uploading. But um, So what's interesting there is, again, uh, um, George had you know, a, a reel of cues in front of him, and he um, chose two that were right next to each other. And this would be when we're jumping ahead, but this would be when Barbara reaches the house. Again, it's a suspense cue, and he just lets the entire thing play. And the beginning of that is interesting, too, because it contrasted to the previous one that had that little abrupt opening. This one fades in with the strings also doing like the, the very uh, the very high trilling. You know, it's like they keep that. Uh, that's like a technique that keeps the the uh, sound of the string going where they're the violin players are going really quickly to like keep that sustain happening. But, but it's a little bit different because instead of a long bow, it's short and tight. Yes. Like uh, here, here is an example of long bow. Every time they change the note, they're going a different direction. But earlier on, it was very short, rapid um, strokes of the bow on the violin. Yeah. So again, he make, he lets the entire cue play um, so he found something that just like worked really well there. I don't think he was really inspired one way or the other by that cue in contrast to the opening of the film where, um, he certainly made the, the, uh, he certainly made the credits last as, you know, so that he could play that entire cue. So, um, and those are the only two JBQs in the used in the movie. Isn't the isn't fire? Oh, you're Tommy right. Andy. There's a third one. So there you go. Um, and but Jack Cookerly is in here again, um, uncredited, but he's but he's in here again. Now the next one. Um, so we're back in the cemetery. Um, there's no music until um, this creepy fellow comes walking along and. We want to have, some, you know, or George wanted to have something to uh, kind of anticipate what's coming. And uh, this cue was not found for a long time. And the reason is it wasn't wasn't found when I did um, when I put They Won't Stay Dead together, the compilation together. Um, the reason is, is because it's on the S series. Now, I knew that it sounded familiar uh, and what the what would happen frequently in capital high Q is they would do these variations. And so in terms of the S series, there was variations on some of these longer cues that were in the D series or, or some of the other categories. And oh, they would, so it um, wasn't in the, it wasn't with the D series. It was, right. the series. you could hear it's, 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 it sounds, it's, it's a George Harmel Q. Um, it's it's the code name is ZR, which stands for Zephyr Records. That was his uh, record label, and he has like some other cues as well. But a ZR, where he has some other codes, I believe as well. But ZR was one of the main ones. And um, well, let me play it how you hear it in the film, which is it has a very long echo. It's a short cue. Here, with this is not what the pre-packaged music sounds like. This would have been something that George elongated for use in the film, and, and just and you can hear he lets it fade out. Um, but that's Carl like a tape, a tape delay. Carl wouldn't have but, done that. He he could have done it. I don't know if George would have asked him. You know, hey, I need this to like extend, and they did that with the you know with the echo. But um, apparently the late image was also able to do that same kind of effect. So um, it's basically a, a tape 
fed into another tape, I guess, and it gives you that delayed effect, and you could, uh, you know, control the feedback. So if you turn it way up, you're going to get that, you know, that rapid kind of repeating that's going. But this is what the actual cue sounds like. <laughs> a little extra bitty there. <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, George found something that worked, but it didn't completely work the way he wanted it to. Uh, so, you know, that's why they created that extra effect to it. Um, but that's the first example of a George Hormel credited cue. Um, we don't know if he actually wrote it, but it's, you know, <laughs> it's, it's in his wheelhouse. So, um, And it's on the Waxworks record if you know, yes. crack yours open yet. and of course that yeah. one works really well because again you have the plotting the slow kind of walking I, th yeah. I think when that is being played going from my mind's eye here the camera is like over Heinzman's shoulder and yes. you're looking at Barbara right so it really gives you the effect that it's like almost from his uh, POV and uh, I also, also really like the ending how it stretches out because then after a while and it gets all crazy it almost sounds like this like dissonant like Almost sounds like the crickets that we're going to hear later. Yeah, it has like a weird, like kind of, like really disorienting kind of sound. Like almost like if you got into like a car accident or something, and like you know your, your mind's all like, you know, like and, and mind is at that point. Whatever it is, George liked it because it's used several times. Like that effect is used several times, and as it repeats, it it the the sound actually deteriorates, so it becomes more electronic sounding. Yeah. It's just because of the quality of the the echo repeat is is it's not going to be as robust as when you first start it's going to you know it's going to be a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy and as the copies go on they become very mechanical sounding and so it works um, to its advantage yeah exactly so I, again it's like a maybe it was a happy accident we, we don't know if um you know again without being there we don't know did george ask Carl to make that, or is it something that he tinkered with and, and made himself? Um, is uh, Did they make a whole bunch of these things, and George just figured out how to piece them into the film? Because, uh, like I said, we're going to see some other examples of it. Um, or were they, you know, made, were they custom made each time he was, he was, uh, he, you know, the need came up, and he was looking for something specific. So, uh, we'll never know because none of the people are around anymore, and it's 50 years. Even if they were, it's 50 years afterwards. I don't think anybody would remember that kind of detail. But um, we now come to one of the most uh, prominent cues in the film. Um, this is a uh, theme craft cue. Uh, it just has the basic heavy agitato, um, you know, description. But... Um, I was told uh, that this was actually written by Jack Cookerley. Not it's credited to Bill Luce and John Seeley, but it's actually Jack Cookerley who wrote it. And um, and I tend to believe him. And the reason is, he says that this cue is originally called the Monster Walks. And if you look at the original cue sheet, there are some handwritten um, notes or titles next to the uh, the more generic title. So at yeah, some we, point, I'm sorry, what's that? Do we have a picture of that? I'd love to see yeah, it. Yeah, you know, I, I should have prepared that. I didn't. Um, now that I'm thinking that it had some handwriting on it, maybe we should, we'll have that the next time. Okay. But um, it, it is credited as the monster walks. It's a, somebody hand wrote in. I don't know if it was person at Capital or the person at ASCAP or, you know, whoever who keeps the cue sheets, but somebody did write in that title. So um, at some point, um, I was told Capital High Q that these tracks had, maybe, maybe it was pre, it could have even been pre-distribution of the library. But um, at one point early on, these, these tracks had more descriptive titles than, they, than the generic ones, where there's like an LP that has like, you know, <laughs> a half dozen cues with the same name, um, just different codes. So uh, at some point, show. this was called, you know, the monster walks. I, and I think 
it was I changed think, to heavy agitado. I think giving them a more uh, generic title actually helps it better instead of like someone saying, "Oh, the mo I can't in Monster Wars, I can't use this." It actually makes it Cause, yeah, because my scene doesn't have a monster in it, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, whereas, like, if so, here's that plotting, you know, and. Um, George obviously liked the cue because he uses the entire thing except the ending, because the ending doesn't quite fit. Um, it's just the last, you know, little flourish before it like, has a big... Um, it kind of like builds back up again, but, but this is the actual cue, so you don't hear it. Um, but he liked the majority of it because he uses it for the entire scene. And, um, and even has to cut... Um, a piece of it to re-loop it, <laughs> so, to, to extend it. So, compared to what we've been hearing before, this is like a very thematic piece, right? Because, I mean, it has like these different motifs it goes through all with the same kind of feel. It, it doesn't really sound like it's building to something, but it sounds like a, just a lot of variations, um, more than some of the other tracks. And again, the use of the entire track is really effective through the whole scene. Up to a, you know, Here's the, the double ending, which George doesn't use because it would kind of kind of defeat the purpose so, yeah. like imagine barbara gets into the house and, and you hear that yeah. <laughs> you <know? laughs> so yeah that wouldn't work quite as well so jim the hideous sun demon the second clip, yes uses this um similarly they use a, a bigger chunk of it but they don't use the whole thing but it's interesting to kind of see and they use this they go back to this cue a couple times you know it's kind of like the hideous sun demon cue really it's like so, so it, here but yeah here's a so we'll play this clip from that but here's a good example of again just cutting up the the tracks way too much and not letting them really you know i guess um support you know there's not enough of the tracks to really support what's happening on screen where you get like that sense of nuance or whatever you know like the audience isn't given the 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 chance to really um feel something where it's suddenly cut and it's like a completely abrupt turn into something else so it's Just when you think they're going to let it play out, they kind of switch gears. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I'm getting a kick out of watching those because it's like someone stealing George's score in a way <laughs> before yeah. he, before he used it. <laughs> yeah, it's like the, some of the some of the uh, Italian zombie movies. I think I know, like City of the Living Dead or whatever that uses like Goblin score uh, for Dawn and Suspiria. It's like seeing them done in a, in a different way. It's just, like retroactive feeling of uh, George's soundtrack, but from movies. Maybe, the interesting thing about that that 
clip is it's actually they do use a, a decent chunk of it and i think they use it effectively as you know the monster's kind of running away and running through some nice long shots but it's like it's the you know it's the abrupt change from another track to that at the beginning and then like i said it gets to the end and it just like it's like they lift the needle up and they put something else on that just doesn't kind of flow at all um and, and george doesn't do that at all you know george is mixing cues he often does it in such a way that you're not aware that that's not how the cue was written yeah right i agree with that then, uh, i would think that it's so much harder to chop up the cues and to and to keep finding more to put in there um, unless you can't like decide, you can't decide on something, you can't decide what you want the scene to be, then it would make sense to just throw everything in there. But I would just think it's so much harder than finding the right piece and just letting it play um, and letting it do its thing. <laughs> so, well, or, you know, or, or else why not just use a different piece of music? You know, this has to be a good example of George cutting the movie to the actual cue because it ends right at the perfect point oh yeah oh yeah this, this just with Barbara, I mean, there's a deliberate yeah. there's a deliberate use yeah. of that track For, and if you think about it it's that's cemetery to the door of the farmhouse yeah and to to a b it with the scene that we just saw the monster attacking in the beginning made sense but then when it's running away where's the terror because he's not uh there's no threat of him harming anyone else whereas in night he's uh, Bill is chasing uh, Barbara the entire time until they get to the, you know, the, the outside. There was always a sort of a threat there until she closes the door. I'll, I'll play devil's but, advocate only to say that the monster kind of running away, you, you know, you could say that the monster is Barbara in that scene, right? She's running from something. Well, what he's running from is this, it's like he's turned into this creature. He's mm -hmm. now theoretically killed this guy. And it's like he's got to get away, um, but again, it doesn't. It doesn't have the finesse of letting the music kind of play through. So, for for the parts of it that work, where he kind of lets the music go, like it very quickly takes a left turn. The the one thing about its use in Night Living Dead because because it's not long enough, um, uh, it, it's the the if you listen to the cue. Or you listen to the soundtrack with the film uh the part where it's wrapping up it's kind of doing like that big build up and the and the chords are going bum, 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 ba -da -da -ba. It's, you could hear it's like it's starting to wrap up um it, it doesn't completely work but what saves it is that's when the car starts to roll and heinzman's holding on and he uses that shot where he's kind of like really desperately hold. It's kind of like Barbara's point of view. And he's, you just see like the little piece of Heinzman in the rear, you know, like that little corner mirror or window. And he's like really holding on and then he finally lets go. So it's, it kind of does wrap up yeah. the first part of that. Um, so in that case, that music makes sense that it's like wrapping up, but then the very next shot, he, cuts to an earlier part and lets it start over again yeah. and that's when the car rolls into frame and then you see like heinzman you know kind lumbering of after. Um, lumber and yeah lumber after it he kind of like comes in from the other side um so I also you like get the next we're, we're at the next we're at the next level of the chase so yeah. it kind yeah. of does yeah. work you know when barbara gets to the house and kind of comes around the house and then sees bill again that's one of those yeah. things that, that the the music and the it starts to do that wrap up of yeah. the and, and yeah, it works because now there's a lot of distance between them. Yeah. Um, and uh, and as we talked about in the other episode, when they get to the farmhouse, you'd never see them together in a shot because that would have all been filmed separately. Yeah. So uh, again, it's, there's the happy accident. The the music just really works there, and the the repetition of it works. And as and as it's starting to wrap up. When she rounds the corner and she spies him, you know, in the field, that part of the music just really works with that. It's, it's different than the rest of the chase. So uh, that, that's a, again another good one compared to the, you know, chopping, 
chopping the crap out of it and uh, and hoping something sticks in there. <laughs> so once Barbara reaches the house, then we get a lot of um, we then go into a lot of the short cues, and these would have been on, in the S series, and they're very dif- they were very difficult to find. Uh, what made it easier is that they're all on the cue sheet. So, um, uh, you know, if th- that made it easier to like figure out where, where to look for them. But the, the S series was discontinued early on. So there's not as many of those discs and tapes floating around out there. But, um, this is the, uh, incredibly bombastic cue that plays when, uh, the, the, uh, boar's head, or his trophy head uh, swings into view. And I always wanted to go dun 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 because it seems like yeah, <laughs> yeah, like the next cue just so perfectly kind right. of follows that so yeah he uh what john's talking about is the very next cue picks up <laughs> that's not correct mm-hmm. um nope why am i i'm missing Something didn't load in properly, and I'm missing a bunch of cues that were here, and then they disappeared. Let me see if I can find that one. But um, the one that we just it's heard... It's dreary, dreary Danger, TC-157. Yeah, and it was in here, but I don't know why it's not now. But, but again, um, what I also love about hearing these full clips, even of these short ones, is there there are those big bombastic things... George kind of ignores, you know, to pick it right. up. And it's like, I want this part of the sting and go from there. Yeah, so we have this short cue that's basically building up quickly to a sting. So he gets rid of all of that and just uses the sting on onto the trophy head. And keep in mind, he's going from, you know, it's basically going from complete silence to that really loud sting. This is the, the next part. It's another short cue. And... They all have names like Danger or Fire, and um, they're just like little bits of like mood music, you know, that to create suspense. And I guess George just like all these different little bits. So what happens there is what the the she spies the ghoul through the window, and the the uh, he pulls the clothesline down. So that's a uh, suspense music to pull clotheslines down, too. <laughs> and and rip the phone cord out. <laughs> Wait, he rips the phone cord out? He ca- yeah. he kind of does the clotheslines, and then he kind of like there's like the one thing higher that I always kind of assume is the phone cord because the next scene is like Barbara, you know, getting the, the weird right. So that is. Um... Uh, she's on the phone and this, this music swells up. It's a much longer cue. We heard the first, it's again, another George Hormel cue. Yep. And we heard the uh, first part of it, which isn't used in Night of Living Dead. It was in that opening sequence of Teenagers from Outer Space for absolutely no reason because it's, it's you know, if, if you're going to score, you know, with this kind of like wide open uh, sparse sounding music, you wouldn't suddenly cut to this um, stinging, you know, very loud horns, but that's how this cue. So, first, we're going to listen to the whole cue. Oops. Oh, let's see. Weird the wrong, it's the wrong weird eerie or weird <laughs> action. So, it's this one. Isn't used in that book. So 
funny because every time I hear a track where George kind of lops off the bombastic beginning, it just reinforces. It's like, yeah, you could have done that for that opening track. <laughs> But then this works great because she looks outside and sees the rules and going about right. and you get that. And I like how right there that little ending nuance it's kind of like a low bed of you know just the like a low string um it fits perfectly with the going up the stairs yep. and then the and then the stinger so here's where george manufactured a, a basically a you know an echoed stinger so it sounds like he used the two from the library, but I try to identify what that little snippet is would be almost impossible. It could even be sped up, um, and so the pitch may be off. Uh, but you can hear how it like it, it, it goes through the whole thing until Ben slams the door. So you can hear how it becomes like a a bad facsimile of itself. It's after interesting a while. to note that, like the other, it's kind of happening at this moment of shock. For Barbara, right? right. It's like... But so when you put those two together, this is how it sounds in the film. So again, a picture that she's on the the telephone. It's the soundtrack is silent while she's on the phone, and you hear a little bit of the uh, what's it like that weird dial tone? Um, not really a dial tone, yeah, like a kind of like a warning that the phone is not working, and then this kind of swells up. That's an early example of George melding two two pieces together, and it, and it works very well. Um, again, that uh, the main body of that cue is from the D series, and it's it's a, a second George Harmel cue, and you hear how it it's very similar thematically to that cue that's in the cemetery, the creeping cue that we heard, and you know, and then like it kind of builds up to uh, the cemetery ghoul attacking Barbara. So that's why when that was the one cue I couldn't find, I knew it sounded familiar. <laughs> like it's it's something in the library from this composer, but you know where it was, I could, could never find the disc it was on until I found the uh, uh, you know several more of the the S series uh, discs and then found it on there. And it's it's another one that is not listed on the cue sheet, so that creates another problem. Um, so that's literally one of the cues that they got for free because <laughs> forgot to list it on the cue sheet. But now we go into um, a lot of little uh, bits. So again, um, again, it's, it's a bunch of short cues. Most of them are on the same reel uh, because the short, the reels with the short cues in the S series have could have like two dozen or more cues on one reel because they're so short. Um, I think this is a good example of George had the scene and he's now just putting music on that, you know, he believes fits 
and he's just kind of like peppering it. It doesn't need to like fill out the entire space. It could yeah. have, you know, spots where there's there's no music. He could have easily just discord these scenes. This is when, um, you know, Ben's throwing stuff into a um, into a bag, uh, you know, from the refrigerator. Barbara's um, kind of walking in the hallway, and the blood drips on her hand. So he's just kind of accenting these different things between the dialogue. He could have just as easily put a long piece of music under this, but chose instead to use these little bits. So that kind of tells you that the scene was cut and he's just, you know, putting the, he's, he's furthering the mood with these little bits. So this is when the blood drips on her hand. That's followed by um, their uh, they're discussing or, or uh, Ben's putting the um, the food into a bag, and Barbara comes up with her what's happening. Um, you know, she's completely confused what's going on, and um, and the scene builds or the music builds to a uh, sound outside of the of the headlights being shattered. Yeah. like about that one is um it's not overly dramatic it's like suspenseful but it's not overly dramatic until those last few notes and they really do sound off kilter like they like that is the ghoul you're now reminded that there's ghouls outside yep. and that little bit ends on the on the sound of the and it, actually you see it you see the uh you know it cuts to the outside and you see the ghoul throw the uh the stone into the into the headlight so um that's like that's a very effective cue it works really well and i think that's why he liked these little these little bits and pieces instead of a long cue and we're going to get to a long one in a second here but i just want to point out that those short ones um were all in the theme craft um category of of uh you know which were which were the bill loose and john seeley owned cues but those are all low numbers, which means that all of that, those short little bits that we heard um, from the stinger on the trophy heads to the, uh, the blood dripping on the stairs, all of those would have been composed by David Rose. And you can hear they all kind of have like a similar sound to them compared to some of the other stuff. Um, so here we get to a long cue, and this is where Ben goes outside to confront the, the ghouls and takes a tire iron to their heads. Who does and this, this again? Wait, what's that? Who's the composer on this one? So this is the first one by Ibe Glinderman. Yeah. And this, this would have come later in the library, like a good, um, where we're talking like the mid to late 50s in the... Uh, um, most of this stuff that we're hearing, especially those short cues, uh, the ones composed by David Rose, the Glindemann stuff came when Oli Gerg came from uh, Denmark, and he brought music cues with him. Uh, he, he took over the uh, administration of the Capitol High Q Library, and he's the one that's writing to Carl Hardman, corresponding with Carl Hardman, and telling him, uh, you know, we'll defer the payments and don't use these old cues. You know, we're going to give you some new ones. Um, the Glindemann stuff would have been part of the new ones. Now, uh, one thing that um, before I start playing this one, um, one way that you can date Capital IQ, actually any Capital Records, just trying to get to the... My computer hates every move that I do here. Um, <laughs> if you notice on the right, this is one of the disc labels. Um, this is only on the discs. It's not on the tape boxes. But um, you notice 
over on the right side above the track listings, there's a, a code HB-2263. The first letter, the H, tells you what year it is. So um, for capital, I, this has to do with the disc manufacturer, and that's why the tapes don't have it. So it has to do with the, uh, it. it's, it's how they date the, the uh, there were several plants in um, uh, the United States that were pressing these discs. And there's even a way to tell which ones are which. Um, I forget what that is. I think most of them were made in Los Angeles, uh, but I could be wrong about that. Um, but the H refers to the year. So some of the early capital IQ discs have an F. An F means 1956, I believe. So if we go um, F, F, G, H, this would have been 1959, 58, 59. Yeah, it could be off by a year. But um, some of the later ones you'll, you, know, you would see that have a lot of the Danish composers are in like the M's and the L's and the U's and the, you know, so that they were made like, you know, a good 10 years after, but... Um, this would have been one of the, the newer cues, even though it's, you know, 19, 1958 uh, to 1960, something like that. But that's how you can date um, capital high Q material, um, really any capital record. So this one, oh, wait a second. Um, space drama? Yes, this one is space drama, right? What, what were we just looking at? Okay, so I just got that wrong. We're here. We're looking at a theme craft reel. So yes, it would be ninth, probably nineteen fifty-eight. Um, I would have to pull up a, a disc label for space drama. I could do that while we're while we listen to it. But um, as I said, you know that was the tape box. The tape boxes don't have that because it, it refers to the year it was pressed, not the. Uh, it's not like a code that's used to used on the reel-to-reel -reel tapes. But space drama would have been one of the newer cues. It's a long cue, and um, it's very chaotic and disjointed. Dialogue. Um, once it fades down, then, and then it 
quickly goes to another cue. Yeah. There's some interesting variations here. Ice court at the end. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's interesting because it almost feels like there are there are multiple endings that somebody could theoretically kind of cut and then bring forward right. to kind of it's like. I, I really like that cascading, the strings you know at that end part is really cool, but it, it, it's not in the film, <laughs> so that's like one of the. It's just one of those cool things. Um, Am I muted? No. no. Um, it's just one of those cool things that you discover from this library, um, you know, that you were pointed to by, you know, George Romero using all the good bits. Um, but there's other, like, little cool things to, like, hear and all this stuff. So it's I enjoy, like, hearing the whole thing. And that's why um, when putting it out on CD or, you know, putting the cues together for waxwork records, I encourage them, you know, use the entire thing because, you know, don't edit it like how it's used in the movie. Sometimes yeah. it's interesting to have that as a, as a companion track, but, um, uh, you know, you want to hear that entire thing. There's no reason to just lop that off because you're not watching a movie or appreciating the music. So, so Jim, um, I got a question for you on when you put out the CD, you yes. would, you used all the original track names, so that's, I think, where a lot of people got their first awareness of the the, the real names of these library cues, because the the very Sarabans album came up with titles. Right. Um, and with Waxworks, they went away from that and they went with kind of descriptive titles. Was that, is there not, because uh, I thought there was a either a copyright issue or there, there was something about needing to retain the the q names with them that that's just how i did it you know licensing everything so um, <laughs> you know I, you know i could have had the actual name and then under it put a descriptive name but i chose to put that in the liner notes instead and um you know it's just how i decided to do it i, I don't know what anybody else's it you know situation was when they licensed it or who said to them that like the very saraban to my knowledge was actually licensed from holy gear so the the administrator of capital high q i don't know if he still had all of those tracks you know there's there's a few discrepancies that we'll talk about when we get to them um but otherwise um it, it just seemed the best way to do it you know, why, I why, would I want, why would I want to rename these tracks? I want people to see as much of the information. Like, seeing the tracks like this with the actual names is as close as you're going to see the actual cue sheet. And even yeah. the cue sheet's yeah. wrong. So, um, for me, it's it's more about getting it right and getting the right information out there more than putting on a certain presentation that, you know... Um, as, as you see, there's little bits and pieces to this stuff. It's not as easy as just saying, that's the drive to the cemetery, and then that's this over here. Even the very <laughs> Saraband has like some has some goofy names for the way that they yeah. have put all this stuff together. So um, better to have like the real thing. This is what these tracks were called. Let's put that information yeah. out there. I think for anybody interested in the history and interested in the, the library music, it just gives it that much. Yeah. It's tangible when you're like, oh, especially when you get to like, this is another Mysterioso track. The, the other deal is that um, Capital High Q is, it is a very mysterious library. 
because um, if you think about it, most of the libraries, most of the music libraries were European, um, and, and some of them are still in existence. So um, while Capital Haiku had a lot of European composers in it, it was more of like a clearinghouse. And the, the situation for them to make something like this, you know, just came along this one time, and it really hasn't been repeated. And um, so you just ended up with this music that really spoke for a large portion of popular culture in the 50s and, you know, early 60s. You know, I don't think you could have turned the television on without hearing some of this stuff. So it's really ingrained um, in, you know, the, the viewers of that time. And so we got a slice of it in this movie um, when the when this music was already outdated you know it 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 and it uh enticed a lot of us to go back and watch things like you know sea hunt and the bat masterson <laughs> bat masterson <laughs> which was like a western or the texan or you know um to to see gumby. how many of these things that we could <laughs> yeah gumby see how many of these things that we could pick out so uh or like other uses for them so uh um I, I always just think of uh, what, what Capital IQ reminds me of and like ties into Night of the Living Dead um, very well. Um, if you think of like those color, uh, like Frank Sinatra films, you know, where everybody's like in a suit and tie and they're all, you know, buttoned up and they're all, they all have a certain decorum. Um, I just picture that era and there's just this violence under like just percolating below the the decor the nice decorum everybody's putting on and uh, it's just to me so much more grisly than you know a movie like uh say like the crow where you know the the events in the crow are are grisly and gruesome and you know it makes sense that it's a re you know for the revenge story that's being told but if you ever just look at the setting of the crow it's like why don't these people move? You know, they, they live in a in completely, you know, decrepit, you know, stay, like move to somewhere nicer. You know, it's, it's, it's really hard when, um, to have like a horror movie, to have horrific situation when the, the setting already looks horrific, you yeah. know, and that's why night living dead works because it's this commonplace setting where, events just spiral out of control and become horrific. So that's what I always get from this music, this kind of like the nice sheen that's been put on the whole thing. But just below the surface, there's all this chaos just waiting to like break loose. And it's going to end in like the most, um, the worst violence you can think of, you know, a, a mother being stabbed by her daughter, the brother dragging the sister out of the house, you know into like you know all these hands and you know pulling her apart and stuff so it, it all works for me with this music you know very well and and that in that period where um you know the newscaster has the tie on and he's trying to like he's trying to keep like the decorum the decorum yeah. going and the and the reserved nature going so and then he's got frank doke saying drag him in the street and burn him so. right and he's saying just this <laughs> horrible crap um, let's do um, just two more short ones, and then we'll. Oh, I just, just want to talk about that one a little bit. No, yeah, go ahead. Uh, that one I really, really like as well. Uh, I don't know why they call it sort of space drama. I guess maybe like the parts that George didn't use might sound more like uh, space. Well, than, I think it's know. I think it's that thing that you said before. Um, it's like that. Uh, this is a very disjointed piece, like in that. It'll play something dissonant, but then there'll be a lot of space to like let that kind of sink in. So I think it does. It could possibly work well as like that the isolation of space, but it, at the same time, it is a busier piece, hence the drama part of it. So I could see them like yeah. I, I could picture this being used with like a situation where the guys are in spacesuits trying to repair something, and they're against like a time limit or something, you know, to that nature. Um, it can work well, but it, yeah. it, it, it works equally as well as, you know, a scene where a guy's trying to bludgeon a bunch of ghouls with a, a yeah. tire iron. Like, uh, 
like I was saying, that mechanical eerie, that was, I think, the name of the first one, could kind of fit this scene, but this one still works better because the trumpets are so so much more abrasive. And this, because I'm, I'm thinking of more like when the ghouls are actually getting into the house. And what's what I like so much about the arrangement is that it's almost like each trumpet represents a new ghoul that you kind of see. And they're almost coming from all over the place with that, bah, bah, rah, 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 you know, and it's just overwhelming and it's disorienting. And it, you know, no, it, notice, it, uh, notice one of the themes is um, that, ba -da -da, ba -da -da -da, right? It's and and like you're saying, the different trumpets or the different brass are like all playing that, yeah. like almost in a call mm -hmm. and response. And when an interesting part is when the Russo ghoul comes into the house and Ben confronts it, it goes to the flute. Yeah. Going, oh, yeah. Doo -doo, doo -doo, you know, doing that little thing. Yeah. But it so it's the same, but yet it's new. It's exactly what you're saying. It's like now we're seeing like a new a different an, another ghoul. Yeah. We're seeing a new yeah. level of the battle. It's now in the living room. You know, the, like the horror has come into the house, you yeah. know. And, and, and the, the reveal music too, just works we, really yeah, it's yeah, it's a it's a cool revealing that. piece. And, that's neat. And a lot of these um a lot of these like tension cues have a lot of the same motifs. It's a lot of chromaticism, whether it's yeah. ascending or descending. Like in that one, the, the descending part that you like, like to me, it would sound like maybe like, uh, you know, a space, like an astronaut or something falling. But there's a lot of like chromaticism where something's moving, -na 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 -na, right. which, you know, gives gives more tension. And um, a lot of like half steps, bah, 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 which that always, the half step is the, is, is the, most tension that you have is like the jaws thing buh, 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 and just sobbing back and forth that works really well and also um there was oh there's one more other thing that i'm and, getting and, oh, oh, and that along thing. along those lines uh, what you just said about chromatics um to release at the end it's the chromatics in reverse so the the horns are just hitting these notes like bomb and the strings are going da, 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 da. they're going like right down yeah. cascading yeah. down so yeah. it's like the exact thing that you said, but do it in reverse, and it has like a release to like what you just heard. Yeah, I mean, like all, all, so many of these themes have that chromatic, like the opening, uh, the opening theme, the like little. Right. I'm hearing them all. Over. I've never really like paid attention to it, but I'm hearing like, oh, there's chromaticism here. There's this, this, there, there's that's there, and it's not that George knew that like, oh, these all these have these things. I'm going to put them together. It's like. As a composer, you know that that's the stuff that you can add to give these effects. So the all the cues that have a similar feeling are also going to have similar musical motifs and ideas because they always work. You know, the, like you were saying before, the pounding of buh, buh, buh. You know, there's always, oh, can we use this here, use that there. But then, you know, when you have a drama scene, you don't hear any of that stuff because it just doesn't work the same way. But I also, uh, um, before we started, I was listening to the posse cue, which is basically, you know, that, that eerie, you know, open, and it's just four notes. It's da, 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 da. And those are, it's two t tritones just repeated. So it's like one tritone followed by another tritone. So you get like those notes just clashing with each other, yeah. even though they're like spaced out. And that's the other cool thing about like what you're saying with chromatics is that chromatics, you know, if one is lingering, you're literally a half step away. So you're going to create that, you know, yeah. this, this kind of like friction. Between you also keep, you, you keep on pushing it. Like something's yeah. going to happen. That's the whole tension thing. Yeah, 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 you know, so I just wanted cool. to interject that. I always love that. Uh, Cause uh, like the scene when uh, the tire, uh, the, Ghoul in the uh, on the back porch gets hit with the tire iron, and then it shows all the other zombies. You also have all those trumpets going up in like all different right. directions, and it's just like uh, it's just absolutely perfect that it's done that way. So that's got to be another one that George really had to have cut that scene uh, for the music. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, so whenever whenever you get those these long kind of uninterrupted tracks um, that that just kind of hit. You yeah. know, markers at several points. It's like 
it's amazing that he's able yeah. to do that so well. The, 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 the one thing about space drama is among Eve Glindeman's um, uh, collection of cues, there isn't another one like that. So, like, we're hearing a lot of variation cues, you know, that get used or, or like when we first listen to the, uh, you know, the, the, the reel that the first um, Spencer Moore. cue, the Spencer Moore reel that the first cue and the last two cues are used on or are, come from. Um, there, there's like some variations there or like that, the one where Barbara's on the phone, you know, even though the first part of it's lopped off, there's a similar theme in the second part of it that works when she looks out the window. Yeah. Um, there is really nothing else like space drama that I've heard in the rest of the library. <laughs> so it's just, it makes sense that George would have gravitated towards that. It's a very unique sounding cue. And there are other space cues um, of like varying degrees, you know, ones that have movement, others that are just, that just kind of like linger there to give you that space isolation. But um, that one is really quite unique. Yeah. And so I could see why he, jumped in on that and yeah. you know even though it was longer than the scene you know he used his he used it to its advantage you know he, he let enough of it play out so that you got all the variations well i think yeah. he used the best part of it because like i said that yeah. ending doesn't even really fit the right. rest of what you would see for the scene he, he could have used like maybe another 15 seconds of it and but it just you know because there are some cool variations there were just the horns are like stabbing but yeah. It wasn't necessary, and yet he would have had to lop off the ending because while it's it sounds really cool, it doesn't fit what that scene is supposed to be. There's not supposed to be a resolution there. Yeah, you know, and as you'll hear, he lets it die down, and he immediately cuts to something else. So this next one we're going to hear is it's another S Q or a short Q, also theme craft, and it's an early number, so it would have been written by David Rose. And um, this one's called Black Knight, and this is when uh, it well, cuts to, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Barbara um, is uh, looking at the tire iron ghoul whose eyes are flickering. sounds like it's edited but it's not that's like that, that's movie. another that's one of those things where it's like you know it, it has that magic of you could have you could have pictured george putting two cues together that gave right. you that but he found one that had you know those kind of two things that again just work perfectly for that that shot and, and i think um you could tell me what you think of this john this this idea but um the, the uh, there's a lot of contrast between the beginning of the cue and that ending. You know, the ending can only be taken one way. But the other thing, you know, like just imagine if it had been more dramatic and creepy sounding. You know, the way it is is it's just kind of like lingering there. It's it's very subtle, and the whole thing is your the camera's moving in on the ghoul's eyes, and the eyes are kind of like just slightly moving or you think they're maybe moving because there's a shadow in front of them. So that, you know, it, the first part of it works perfectly because it doesn't kind of like play its hand too much. You know, it, it, it doesn't go over the top, you know, it didn't really need to. Well, it's, it sounds like that. I don't know if you meant John me or John number one, uh, but to me, yeah. it sounds like that John, John, was... Jonathan, you, Jonathan, you, <laughs> <laughs> It sounds like that cue was written deliberately for that, like, you know, uh, you need music that sort of fits certain things. So, like, uh, maybe, like, one way that that cue could be used, like, if someone's sort of sneaking through a house, you know, like, uh, you know, right. uh, like a girl that might have been kidnapped or something in a, in a doctor's laboratory and she's walking around upstairs and there's that, like, you know, soft serene and then you open up a door and you see, like, the monster sleeping or something where it's not attacking or doing something strong it's just there's like a little bit of a shot there and it works really well for that because that's almost exactly well i don't know 
if there's so much shock, it, maybe the shock is just Ben going, don't look at it. Or because there's nothing shocking that happens. It's just he pulls the ghoul away. But I like that the music is put there because when you, the way that I kind of take it is when she's, when Barbara's looking at uh, the ghoul, it's almost like there's like a, the music has like some sort of curiosity to it. You know, not like she's afraid of what she's just like, it's almost curious, she's just staring at it and kind of wondering, you know, what is this and what's going on? I think that fits really well. Yeah. Again, I, I, I can't help but think that that, that sting, that dun dun dun, he could have used, you know, he could have cut that out and used that at several different points. Um, and again, it just marries to that kind of soft yeah. setup so well. Maybe it's that because it's like authoritative. Because Ben says, "Don't look at it," and then it happens. Don't look. Bum bum bum. So I guess yeah. maybe there's something yeah. like that. Going Which on. is why I think that had you had you asked me independently, do you think that's two cues cut together? I'd say, yeah. Even though I think it works brilliantly, I would say, well, that was George finding two things that fit yeah. perfectly together, and he did. But they just came together. <laughs> but I think that's the strength of these composers that just write all these pieces like i don't know how they're writing it but maybe they have their own scenes in their head you know yeah. things like okay you're just writing stuff without any reference to what it's going to be used for so like okay maybe i'll write something where it sounds you know uh two people are really talking and then one gets angry you know and maybe i'll write something where uh everyone's laughing and then you know something scary happens you know yeah, it, it's one of the downsides. And again, having kind of tried to research to find clips of things where we could show music being used. There are so many of these cues where it's like, I would love to know where else, you know, did this cue get used somewhere? I wish there was kind of a reverse lookup we could do to say, okay, who else used uh, Black Knight? And, and under what circumstances? And does it work as well as how George used it? Because, you know, there's part of me that's like, there's no way that somebody's got a better scene it's <laughs> that piece of music, right? Is that capital still around? Maybe someone should uh, send them a message. Hey, we want to go through your archives. It's got to be some like, you know, they got to have that stuff, some spreadsheet somewhere, maybe, and then you can just put it, you know, D twenty four. Okay. No, you hope you could go to the Capitol Records building. I mean, that's the you know, that's the famous, the you know, this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I just I just fear that anybody would have long since thrown away those documents as not important. <laughs> I don't think so. I think for like a company like that, you know, that's you know that that's so big that all that stuff is just stored. Like, I'd be more surprised if no one knew where it was than someone just you know. <laughs> and, uh, it down. If you think about it, that was all on paper at the time, right? Yeah. It's like, or maybe someday they put it on microfiche, but even that. You know, at some point, somebody says, why are we storing rooms full of microfiche of stuff we don't care about, you know? Well, I guess all, all we'll have to do is an email. Yep. Or a trip to so let, Jim, get on top of that. <laughs> let's jump to the uh, last two for now. The shock this suspense? Is, yeah, this is shock suspense. It's also a Glindeman cue. Jack Russo is highly flammable. So that that's an interesting one because it's um uh, it's basically uh it, it the scene descends into fire, you know, like a, a blaze of fire. And the strings kind of sound like that. You know, it doesn't start that way, but it kind of sounds that way. And what's also interesting, you could hear how different that sounds from from space drama. It's almost like the same guy didn't write that. <laughs> you know, would not have written the two, the, those two pieces of music. So um, the one, the one thing I picked up here, listening to it now that I've never picked up on because it's hard to tell uh, in the movie, just on the TV. But at the very end, this is like low bass. Oh, yeah, that and that I think adds a more weight to that part because it just makes it sound like thicker and a little bit more ominous, and it's going to get lost because. You know, low bass frequencies get lost and stuff like that, unless yeah. you gotta, you know. So that's a shame that you don't really hear it that way, but 
Yeah, there's listening to the albums on vinyl and it, on the Waxworks vinyl is is I think enlightening because um, even you know, you're familiar with the music from the movie even if you've listened to the, the original soundtrack album, but being able to kind of hear it that that, that higher resolution isolated you know you pick up on things that just get lost or have yeah. gotten lost through the years obviously but. and also uninterrupted like uh for me i had to find all the dawn cues i guess not really with jim's help but whoever put that stuff online i found it independently you know searching chris and, Rockies. yeah <laughs> i had part of it but i would find little things like that like oh okay this is whatever and you know the the music is played under a bed of people talking and sometimes the talking hides certain parts and then listening to it, you know, naked, it just makes the part sound different or sometimes a part seems louder than it, it normally does. And it sometimes gives the uh, the cue a little bit, like just a slightly different dimension, you know? And you certainly watch, you hear it differently in the film once you've now got that kind of yeah. familiarity of it. So before we go, um, so we're obviously gonna have to pick this up the next time um, but you can see it once you get past the, um, you know, really deep diving into some of these reels um, and you're just dealing with the music, it's easier to, it, you know, it gets going. So um, I'm confident we could finish it up the next time. Yeah. Um, but uh, before we go, I was originally planning to have Kevin Christ come on and talk about the Living Dead weekend that's coming up. Uh, but he couldn't get his Internet to work where he was, so we didn't get to see Kevin, so we'll just talk briefly about the Living Dead Weekend, which is coming up, and we've got some of the guests here. Um, this is John Amplis, of course. Now, the what they're doing, the premise here is that uh, it's, it's going to be the all-star lineup, guest lineup, so it's uh, a bunch of different actors and uh, familiar faces from, you know, the various films instead of doing a reunion all from one film. Uh, so we have uh, John Amplis will be there. And then uh, first time Living Dead Weekend guest, Dan Kamen. He was the uh, old Chief Woodenhead suit actor in Creepshow 2. And then, of course, Russ Streiner. Russ. Johnny Never from heard. Night of the Living Dead. Never heard of this guy. <laughs> and uh, Daryl Ferrucci, who's been to, uh, creep, uh, to uh, Living Dead Weekend once before. But uh, his claim to fame is playing Fluffy in Creepshow. And then a first-time guest, Ken Peters, um, who we finally pinpointed on previous episode of Night Talk as being a ghoul in Night Living Dead, as well as... My, uh, my biggest regret of not being able to make it out this year will be not getting a chance to see yeah. Ken Peters. So, uh, well, hopefully... Uh, for the 55th reunion in one year, we'll be able yep. to come out for that and we'll be able to bring all these folks back. But you can also see Ken was in um, There's Always Vanilla as well as Season of the Witch. And uh, so he was in a lot of the early George films. He's a good kind of Johnny Carson type host, TV host. Now, uh, oh, no, forget it. <laughs> What's that? I was kidding, I was kidding uh, but his, he, He's not really in any. I thought most of his scenes were uh, cut out. Okay. No, he's well, he's he, one of the few that you see in. He was in a lot of the day for night photos. Yeah. But he's actually in the post truck explosion scenes. Ah. Yeah. So so some of the um, uh, we established that some of the day for night ghouls ended up in the film kind of grouped together in another part. So um, he's one of the ones who ended up there. And then, of course, Paula, at Living Dead Weekend regular, although she hasn't been there since maybe 2018, so it's becoming a while. And uh, Ella Mae Smith. And then we have some of the Day of the Dead leading cast, Lori Cardill, and, of course, Howard Sherman, who missed the big day reunion a year ago. So that's why he's coming in. 
and then uh, first time guest Rami Zada from Two Evil Eyes. An interesting thing is uh, when we posted about him uh, in some of the groups, um, people mentioned another anthology film that he was in called, um, I believe it's After Midnight, which is which is where we're headed right now. But uh, it, it's actually a very good. I watched it. It's on. I believe it's on Amazon or or Netflix or to be one of one of the services and uh it's actually a, a really good uh anthology film that i kind of, you know genre film that i flew under my radar but he's pretty prominent and he's and his role is is pretty cool as you say people remember him from the uh extended version of uh, document of the dead because that his scene was one of the ones that uh, mm-hmm. they were there when they shot yeah, the filming of this, uh, he has a big death scene in the uh, Metronome. Two Evil Eyes. <laughs> yeah. And then we have the, uh, he's, Kevin's bringing in some Return of the Living Dead Part 2 guests, including Dana Ashbrook. And, and Dana's Marshall. always... Uh, Water Dana, right? Um, Dana, whoops. Let me get back to there. Dana was married to Laurie's daughter. Great in Twin Peaks. My computer just hates doing this. Okay. And then, uh, <laughs> Marcia, I'm not sure how to say it, how her last name is pronounced, but also from Return of the Living Dead 2, as well as Tom Matthews from Return of the Living Dead and Return of the Living Dead 2. So. Um, there's a few more guests, but I just didn't get, wasn't able to quickly assemble all of their, um, their well, the new venue banners. sounds really cool. I've, I've yeah, heard at, Kevin talking about that. Yeah, it's at a new venue in Harmony, PA, not far from Evan City. And um, just go to livingdeadweekend.com for more information. But uh, we hope to see you there. It's October 14th through the 16th. Well, we know John 1 isn't going to be there, but I believe John 2 is going to make it, right? <laughs> yeah. So, that's it for night talk. Um, I have to go to bed because I need to get ready to go do a convention in Indianapolis tomorrow. <laughs> it starts. Yeah, so, we'll, fun. yeah we'll, we'll call it quick, but we did do over, uh, over three hours again, so three and a half hours, so. Part one. Yeah. <laughs> we Time flies music, if you're having fun. Oh, yeah. We knew the music was gonna be a was gonna be a, a blockbuster, so yeah. but um good to see everybody and uh yeah, so we'll see you again the first Tuesday of the month. So which will be around the anniversary of night, right? Yeah. October. Yep. October. So take care and we'll see you all soon. Thanks. Adios.